Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Stamps.com. Listen, these days you can get practically everything on demand, like our podcast. Listen whenever you want, when it's convenient for you. Did you know you can even get postage on demand? All you need is Stamps.com. I've been using them for years to send out coffee cups, T-shirts, posters. My wife loves it. You know why? Because it saves you time, and time is money and energy. So what I'm going to do is this right now. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else and click on the radio microphone at the top of the home page and type in Joey. Again, <coughs> go to stamps.com before you do anything else and click on the radio microphone at the top of that home page and type Joey. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to give the church family a special offer. A f- four-week trial. Four-week trial including postage and a digital scale. So go to stamps.com, click on the radio mic on the top of the homepage, and type in Joey. That's stamps.com, enter Joey. Number two, one of the most interesting products I've received the last week is the Ridge. The Ridge is a minimalist wallet that helps you reevaluate your everyday carry launched by a father-son team, funded on Kickstarter in 2013. The Ridge now resides in the pockets of over a quarter million men and women. The RFID blocking wallet is made by two metal plates, either titanium, carbon fiber, or aluminum, bound together by durable elastic bond. Your credit cards, your licenses, just the stuff that you need. It's light. I love it for traveling. So what I'm going to do is this, okay? It's sleek. It's got metal plates bound together by durable elastic band. So you will lose nothing. You understand me? It's easy. It's front, minimal. uh, That's designed to let you ditch your bulky wallet. What I'm going to do is I just want you to go. Do me a favor right now as family because you're going to love it. Go to RidgeWallet.com slash church and use promo code church, C-H-U-R-C-H. And what I'm going to do is today only I'm going to get you 10% off with free worldwide shipping by going to RidgeWallet.com. For right now, just go to RidgeWallet and take a look. It is one of the most interesting products out there. And if you're a traveler, you're a sportsman, you ride a bike, stuff like that, you don't want bulky stuff, Ridge Wallet is the way to go. So right now, today, I'm going to get you 10% off from free worldwide shipping by going to RidgeWallet.com slash church. Again, that's RidgeWallet.com slash church. You use promo code church. Number three. I just received this in the mail about uh, four days ago, and I've been using them. And I got to tell you something. It's one of the best brushings my teeth has ever gotten. And even though my teeth are the color of, like, uh, chartreuse, this thing worked tremendous. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. Yet most of us don't do it properly. Quip is a better electric toothbrush created by dentists and designers. Quip was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and enjoyable. So far, I've got nothing but five-star results. Your teeth and your mouth feel cleaner. It just, just, you know, it has sonic vibrations, and they gentle enough on your sensitive gums. So do me a favor. For starters, you know what I always tell you. Go to Quip.com. Go to Quip.com and see what I'm talking about. This is a phenomenal project, product, especially if you're a traveler. So what I'm going to do is this. I love Quip. That's why I love Quip, because they're backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just $25, and if you get to Quip.com slash Joey right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. It's a great Christmas gift. I'm telling you right now. You got a girlfriend, a wife, a husband, somebody you don't know that you want to give a present to. This is perfect. It's affordable. And they'll love you forever. So your first refill pack is free at getquip.com slash Joey. Look at Lee, boy. I love Lee, dude. If I could fucking have a, if I had a little bit of a Lee, man, then I could take with me and keep somewhere <laughs> in a little, like a wheelbarrow. But for Lee's, I'd put Lee in one of those, bro. Sounds Your, nice. Thank you. Yeah, and pillows in there, too. I ain't just putting you in there on the metal. 
Oh, that's real. Like some people would do. Real you would put them in the shed in the back. Oh, and no. Feed them food from uh-uh. time to time. What are you talking about? What do you mean? What I'll put you under a warm lamp, Lee. That's what I would do. <laughs> put it's them starting to get creepy lamp. now. It sounds like I'm hostage and, in both of your houses. Hey, calm down and be a good pet, you little put buddy. Like, put like a chain around his neck <laughs> with a fucking chain hooked to the wall and stuff like that. Yeah, but a nice chain, like a gold chain. Yeah, you know I don't saying? know if I go that far. Oh, there ain't no gold for this. You can't put a silk hat on a pig. You know oh, what I'm saying? Oh, my God, Joe. It's fucking Thursday, November 8th. Kick this fucking mule leak. Come on. That's as good as it fucking gets, Theo Vaughn. Praise God. A little sly in the family stone Lee, coming at you. The gristle missile, baby. On a Thursday morning. What are you fucking nuts? 20 to life. No parole. Fresh from Buffalo, New York. You didn't have a fucking uh, beef on wick. I didn't have any. Up. Dude, I didn't. Somebody threw a piece of meat at me though, on one of those street corners. I don't know if that was wick or not. Did you eat it? No. Nah, no, wick is the roll. The roll is called wick. Oh, no. It's Nobody a, uh, told me that. I should have come in here first. Beef on wick. No, no. Cause you should they took be a travel wick. agent, too. No, 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 no. I just know what quality is and where. <laughs> yeah. And nobody makes a bad fucking beef on wick in Buffalo. Like, it's like a disgrace for them. Really? Yeah, it'd be like disgrace for them. It's known. Right. That's what it's known for. Yeah, I feel bad. I feel disappointed oh, that I didn't get that shit. vibe. You Some know? fucking pierogies from the Polish neighbors. Oh, yeah. Sauerkraut, pierogies, fried. Like dumplings, only you know it's not cat. <laughs> yeah. For people like Lee and shit. I don't mind a little bit of cat, but you ever had fox meat, Lee? I don't think so. Have you? Yeah, I've had fox meat. When was this? It's not. Mu- it's more ligament than muscle, but it's good, you know? Fox, uh, and dude, the crazy thing about fox, I was talking about this yesterday to somebody, but. Did you ever hunt? Nuh-uh. We caught a lot of shit, though. And we used to bury animals. We lived by, like, a road where a lot of animals would get hit and killed, so we bury them. You know, the first animals I spent the most time with were animals that were been, had been hit by vehicles. And um, so I could, we would bury mostly dogs. What else? I think something else one time. This thing looked like a damn fucking small bear, bro. And it could have been. Dude, because they have Louisiana black bears, a lot of things, you know. And I'm not saying they're black or anything like that. I'm just saying they happen to be black when people see them. And they're just, uh, you know, and, and uh, but we would bury all kind of animals that would get hit by us. But What are you, a fucking undertake? I see a dead uh-huh. animal, I leave it the fuck alone. It's bad luck. Yeah, but it was, I don't if think. they it was, were alive and they were suffering, and then you shoot them in the leg. Yeah. Or whatever the fuck you do. But if they're dead, this is the Department of Public Works that's in charge of cleaning up dead animals. Yeah, but the Department of Public Works, I think, comes for people that are paying taxes and people that got, you know, they didn't come bust. Dude, they had some, they had a veterinarian or something or like a, some dude, somebody used to kill, throw dead animal carcasses in a ditch outside of our house, right? For like seven years. My mother would call every week. What come, kind of dead animals? On um, big animals too. Did you grow up in Africa? No. Uh, what the fuck did you grow up? Carcasses. <laughs> Louisiana. I had a couple cats, some possums in my neighborhood. A dog from <laughs> time to time would walk around. You know, I, look, I, and I wish I would have had that, man. But we had somebody. They had a. Uh, I guess this person was a veterinarian. That's somebody that deals with animals, helps animals out. And so this person would come, and whoever they were at night, they're throwing dead animals. You know, instead of paying to get rid of them, they probably cost maybe seven dollars to get rid of them. You know. The whatever I'm sure there's legitimate thoroughfares how you get rid of animals, but this dude's out there, you know, chucking them in the ditch. I guess on his way home, because our neighborhood was kind of a cut through between like a nice area and town. So, um, you never did like a stakeout to see who was throwing animal carcasses. Do we not? Uh, no. I mean, we were out there a lot, but we never saw the guy unless he drove by and didn't throw one out because we were out there. Uh. But then what creep kind of sits next to an animal car? I mean, he probably throw it out elsewhere. But anyway, so the um. But anyway, yeah, my we go out there all the time. My mother would call every week. Come get these, you know. The kids are out there beating each other with people chasing each other with fucking, you know, fucking horse skulls and shit, bro. It was it was wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Joey if I can get that Christmas tea kettle and if I can serve and Lee a couple cups right there, boy. <laughs> Big lead of fart sponge, baby. <laughs> Welcome to Africa, Lee. <laughs> I, normally i like all your sayings i don't like the fart sponge. sorry sorry but and i'm just joking about that i didn't mean that man. i would never say that about no you, it's man. funny when people he, he he's gonna take a liking to it 
It's been like two podcasts since he farted on me. Oh, uh, dude, in some countries, that's a in Japan, that's like a that's like buying somebody a scarf. No, it's you know not. Say you fart on somebody. You know, I'm half Japanese. I'm yeah, 23 you know. and me. Oh, dude, that's yeah. That's why I'm over here farting. Not oh, yet. he's got the thighs of a fucking kung fu fighter, son. I'm telling you, dog. Dude, you got to know different nomenclatures and how to give a <laughs> hug, bro. In Africa, they hit you with a fucking pipe, bro, if they love you. Just take you know? a whiff of that fart. Just I'm not going to take a whiff of your fart. That's Come disgusting. on, bro. Get a little air appetizer, bro. Treat your but nose. Yeah, that is tremendous. Treat man. your snout to some of that fucking free booty pasta, bro, bro. <laughs> oh, my God. Poor fucking Lee. Lee, man. Dude, it's so funny. You know, sometimes when I, I'm not even joking about when I would need to think about something good, dude, I think about Lee, man. Oh, well, thank you. That means a lot. Yeah, I think about you, man. I think you I just... I think about you to laugh. You, I mean, just the, st- the stuff you say randomly. Like, I just want to hang out and, like, listen to what you say during the day to yourself. I just, I feel like it's hysterical. This conversation's getting creepy right here already. <laughs> well, you just Lee, farted I, on I, me. I, How... I, think, I think Lee God might be it. a little cascadone. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know I what you're talking might, about. I no, you know Shopping for closet. peppermint, they call it, dude, yeah, where I'm from. I think from. he's coming out of the closet pretty soon. Uh, they say, hey, you know the boy over there, little, little Lawrence. I don't give a fuck if he's... Lee, I don't care Lee's either, bro. I'll let you hang off my dick like a fucking mountain cat. No, I would never let Lee something. <laughs> Not you guys, but I I don't have the same relationship with him. Yeah, but you're still friends. You can't. I'm friends with him. Lee. I wouldn't fuck him. I would let him touch my dick a little. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Down the, around the holidays, bro? Just to make his day. Oh, he's a prison ham, this guy, bro. I fucking love that boy. Dog, do you know how much money? I told Lee Walk, Walk, Walk and Lee one night. Mm-hmm. You know how much money we can make with Lee on the inside. Oh, my God. Know, just sitting on people's laps. Dealing cards. And rubbing their dick. Yeah. Well, just I'm glad we're bringing this back. You can't just <laughs> sit on someone's lap, but they're not going to let it end at just lap sitting. Bro. Uh, so they're not in you. prison because they, 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 they know Gary, how to hold Indiana, back. Gary, Indiana, you're an eight, bro. A warm female. In Gary, Indiana, dog, you're oh, a female Gary, eight, baby. Indiana, I got a guy that'll pay ten G's for you to put a wig on. And, oh and yeah, a special type of podcast. And just me. mug his dick with your fucking neck. He's already written me a letter. <laughs> what does that even mean, mug a dick? <laughs> Lee, you got to get out more. Get off the internet, bro. You got to go hitchhiking, man. I really don't. I don't want to now. You should go hitchhiking Wait, one day as a school project. Yeah, I'm gonna end up dead. No, what school are you in? Are you doing classes online? <laughs> no, I need to be classes here. This is the only. How old are you, Lee? Thirty now. Are you really? Yeah. I thought you were like nineteen, dude. I wish. Are you really thirty years old? Yeah. You're thirty years old. Oh You're my 30. god, bro! My whole perception of you, I thought you were like a, a like a. He you was know, a, he was a college an kid when he first came in here. Oh wow! But look oh, at him now. Now he's a years. fucking young man. That's awesome. Now, now you don't like me as much. You're like, nah, nah, I don't like. No, it's just different. You ever notice when you learn something about somebody you didn't know? You know. Like you see somebody and they're like a lawyer or something, but then you realize they're like a sorcerer or something. Or they do shady shit. Or you see them like ballroom dancing. And you're like, this fucking guy ballroom dances? I always that, that always takes my brain a minute. Or if you see a big, big person and they got their stomach stapled. And now, dude, I was at a pool one time. And I used to work on this farm in the summertime outside in Natchez, Mississippi. And they had... Uh, and this dude, Don Blankenstein, was the pool guy every year, right? And he'd come out there, and I'd keep an eye on him because the dude weighed probably seven or 800 pounds, bro. Jeez. You know what I'm saying? He broke the gate every time he come in. He but fucking, he was the lifeguard? He was the you know, you know, lifeguard, 800 pounds? Bro, he say? gets in the pool? It's trust old. me, nobody's drowning, bro. All the water's out, and the fucking kid who's sick is laying right he there at his feet. He was the boss at the pool. No, he was the, he was the guy who came to put the, the cleaner in the pool. And so... But he'd open the gate, bro, and every time he'd walk through it and bring both sides of the gate down. Like, he was just a, he was going to die soon, you know, when you saw him. You know, so you treated him well. And that's one thing I like sometimes about seeing huge people that remind you how to treat other people. Because you're like, oh, this person isn't going to be alive very long, so you would be extra nice to him. And so, but then Don, one summer, I'm, I'm out there laying by the pool, and uh, and this skinny guy comes in. You know, he could have fit through the gate with 90 of his fucking, you know quintuplets or whatever <laughs> and he comes through the gate and i'm like who? and he keeps talking to me and i'm thinking the guy's kind of a you know peppermint hunter bro you know what i'm saying a little tender and it turns out it's don blanken uh blankenstein he got the stomach thing and he lost all the weight and he was a different person though he wasn't the same I don't know. It wasn't the same, and our relationship was never the same as when he lost. As when when he lost the weight. I think when they take. I don't know what we're passion. talking about. 
Think about when somebody takes away your passion. If you're an eater. Yeah. And, you know, it's like when you first get sober. Yeah. You know, I was telling Rogan the other day, the worst two words in a person's life is sober and diet. I don't want to be involved in drugs. Yeah. But I don't want to be sober either. Yeah. I never want to be sober because it would make my battle, my inner battle, too rough. Yeah. I know my limits with cocaine. I know my limits with pills. I know my limits with alcohol. I've known my limits when I was 25. Anything I did after 25, I did because I wanted to, but I knew my limits. Right. <clears throat> you know, when I went, when I got locked up, I couldn't imagine a world where I couldn't smoke pot. Wow. You couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine, okay, cocaine. I understand not having a girlfriend. I understand being broke, but I never understood a world where I did not smoke weed. Huh. When I was 25 years old, weed controlled my mood. What did it do for you, you think? I was in so much pain when I woke up. And I didn't know that then. You never know it when you're going through. Yeah, yeah, you don't know. Especially at that it takes, age. It takes 20 years to look back. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about it tonight how when I was taking a shower that if I quit comedy tomorrow, it would be to sign back up in college and take a psychology class to oh, become wow. a psychiatrist and do whatever I had to take. I'd probably be 65, but at 65, I would help so many people so deeper Yeah, because I went through it. Yeah, This is not somebody who studied it. I went through it, wrote about it, looked at it. Mm -hmm. I think about it. I think about what made you I broke it down from the macro to the micro. Well, you could put yourself in there. You could put them in your you shoes and vice to. versa. When you become a comedian, yeah. if you're not brutally honest with yourself, it's not going to end well. Wow. And in life, in life in general, yeah. forget about comedy, in life in general, if you're not brutally honest with yourself, it's not going to pan out for you. Yeah. You have to be brutally honest, and a lot of people can't be honest. Brutally honest with yourself. Like, this is not going to work. You know, it's like I went at 27, 29. Like, in what fact? Like at how, the age of 30, yeah. I was, I had made a decision, a uh, 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 decision to do comedy. Yeah. But I also had to make a decision about this hell I was living in. I was living in this party hell. Okay. The drugs and this Where I stuff. would be clean for three days. Oh, yeah. And then snap one night and then tell myself how this was the last time. Yeah. I wasn't one of those pussies at a party that was talking about it. And by this time, I was partying by myself. And this went on for maybe a year and a half. Yeah. And I think by 1995 and a half, I came to the conclusion, like they say in the program, mm -hmm. that you're a fucking junkie. Yeah. And I had two decisions to make. I go, I could either be a junkie and keep fighting this, but the reason why I became a comic was to be a junkie. I want, I read that Lenny Bruce book, and that's the reason why I got into comedy. So if I'm going to get into comedy, let's make a deal. I'll do cocaine three times a week. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. I just came to terms with it. Wow. So you're thinking I'm going to get into comedy so I could do cocaine. I was thinking I was going to get into comedy to have a life. I read that book. We slept with strippers. And yeah. He opened up for jazz musicians, and I was content with that. And yeah. none of that book they talk about being rich. Yeah. Okay. And no and part of that book they talk about being rich. They talk about money. He lived at the Chelsea Hotel. He just talked to life about being what was happy for him. Yeah. And at that time, that's all I wanted. I had been through a terrible marriage. I had already done time, so I was just seeking to be happy. But I knew I had a mend inside. Because you was a real, you had a deviant soul. Your soul was pretty sound, like kind of bif bifurcated or whatever. I was living, called. you know, this wasn't who I was. I right. was a nice Catholic boy who I believed in heaven and hell, and I had right. a belief system. Your inside didn't match all your behavior. Right. My inside did not. So that, that added to it. Yeah. So now, Man, I, had to a... have, now I had to have that inner conflict with drugs. Oh. Fuck you. This is who I am. I've accepted it. Yeah, and whatever happens, happens. That's it. No fucking big deal. Nobody gets their feelings. Hunting like, Easter eggs again, Lee. Oh, you found one, huh? You found an egg, boy. Lee. Welcome to Easter, bro. Y'all killed this Jesus. Here stuff. he comes back, boy. This is good and he brought stuff, a dirty Lee. bag of fucking baked ham this out of the fucking like, cave. 
This smells worse than your neck. This smells like those oh, Honduran's yeah. feet that are walking in. Oh, yeah, boy. It those... smells like fucking Thanksgiving night in a Honduran prison shower. Can you imagine those Honduran's shoes off at night and sleep under a tree? <laughs> I can't even imagine. What that little summer camp must smell like down oh. there. They've been walking for 20 fucking days, those yeah. poor people. Oh, Honduran's will walk 30 hours in a 24-hour day. 20 fucking days, and they're really coming. What know. are they going to do up here, do you think? I think they're trying to seek asylum. You know, living in Honduras, El Salvador right now, those are not good places to live right Makes now. Makes me sad, man. Yeah, my father's from Nicaragua. You know that <clears throat> my father was born yeah, down there. If you know anything about Central America, I know like El Salvador is, the prices are high. They're killing people down there. You know, there's a lady who I talk to from time to time, and she tells me she goes only for Christmas time, mm -hmm. and that she has a house down there, but she can't retire down there. Oh, wow. Because they just kill you on the streets, and she, there's more murders, something like that, to that effect. <laughs> so I, I don't know if it's El Salvador. I'm just cracking the but joke. Right, but right, but yeah, if that's your neighbor, things can be great where you are, if that's the neighborhood you're in, you know? That's heartbreaking. It's a different, you know, it's like when you read the Roberto Duran book. You know, he grew up on the streets of, of Panama, you know, he grew up with this guy that was called El Magico or some shit. And the guy was like a shaman. And he taught him how to hustle on the streets, wow. how to live on the streets. You know, that's Central America. You know, if you ever watch Miami Vice, the, the, either the, the second or third episode of Miami Vice. I read the book, I think. There's an, no, there's no fucking book. There's an interesting, Miami Vice, there's I an think. Interest, there's an interesting scene where. There's little kids. Yeah, what are you laughing at me for, Lee? I'm a, I don't know. I'm laughing at both of you. I don't know what's right. There's little boys in the room. Oh, wow. There's a drug dealer cutting the deal. <laughs> there's a drug dealer cutting the deal, but he's got like a coin yeah. in his hand. And, and what happened? Like, and there's like four eight year olds with no <laughs> shoes on in the room in different corners. Jesus. Is it a magic trick? No, 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 no. And he's talking a business deal. It's like you coming to me. And you want to buy 20 kilos of blow. Okay. And, 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 and what are the little boys doing? Just they're chilling. Like, they're like fucking assassins. Oh, really? The eight-year-old assassins that come from fucking huts with their family. Jesus. And they're just waiting for their, their next assignment. They're all probably packing a gun or a knife, and they got no shoes on. But this drug dealer would play with a coin, and he would talk to the people with the way I'm talking to you. And then from time to time, it would just flip the coin in the air. When that coin landed, one of those shoeless kids would run out and fucking pick it up like it was a fortune. Wow. You know, and, and I remember thinking years later about that scene, how that's how, you know, Pablo Escobar got those kids to love him in, in, in uh, Colombia. Yeah. He went to the poor kids that had no options, and he said, no, I'm going to put a thousand in your pocket every week. But you're gonna kill motherfuckers for me, just like that, no questions asked. But it gave him a feeling of purpose. <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, money talks and bullshit walks. Yeah. At the end of the day, money talks and bullshit walks. really does. I could blow smoke up your ass, or I could put two G notes in your week in your hand every week when you've never had a dollar bill in your hand. Yeah. And tell you, look, I'm just gonna send you to people's houses. Yeah. I want you to slit their throats, kill their kids. Their Jesus. mothers, the dogs. Jesus. If they got goldfish, I want you to poison them too. Jesus. You know that's that's how do you think? Wait, rat poison or something? What, what, whatever. Poison. It's it's just a point. <laughs> fucking fish it's just poison. A, it's just a fucking point I'm trying to make that that's how you get. God. You man. know, take an American ghetto here. You know that's why they call it a, a whatever social sad uh, social color economic. They call it a crisis. Not a crisis. It's coming from somewhere poor. Yeah. And what you need to do to get out of that situation. Yeah, you don't know anything better, man. And yeah, you just, I mean, I, dude, they had this guy when I was growing up named Eddie, right? <clears throat> and he could have been fucking 13. He could have been about 16 or fucking 50, right? I don't know what he was. But he always drove, he had a 5.0 Mustang, you know? Or he drew 5.0 on the side of it or whatever. I don't even remember. It could have been a fucking, <clears throat> it could have been a, you know, a Pontiac Renault or whatever. I don't know what it was. But he always had these two girls, bro sitting on the back of it and that dude was the king you know whatever he said when i was a kid we would have done it because to him he he was the king he had a he had a piece of shit mustang but he had the mustang you know and he was a champ and he would buy you know the chicks would have like uh daiquiri drinks bro and every now and then he'd floor it and one of them would go rolling out the fucking back right onto the concrete bro what did he do for a living i don't know and I didn't care. But if he would have said something to do, like, come do this. Like, I, when I was a kid, I would have done anything, he said. Because he hung out with us and he spent time with us. 
you know, he'd throw the football around with us. And he was a good guy, I think, you know. I mean, I still think he is a good how, guy. How, how, how older than you was he? He probably maybe 7, 8, 10, 12 years. But he, like, could drive. He had, like, the ability. You know, he had a car. He had women. He had, you know, he had things that when you're, you know, an adolescent, <coughs> 12 years old, 11 years old, you see that. You're like, oh, this guy has mobility. You know, this guy has ability. This guy has women. He has everything. So anyway, I'm just saying I can see how ch- yeah, you don't you're not thinking about anything else when you're that age and when you have nothing. Young, remember when you're young and you get influenced? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't get influenced, mm-hmm. but I'd look at guys. There was this guy that I hung out with that was always at the bar in the daytime. He was really good looking. Mm-hmm. Not like, Samuel, huh? No, no. If I was 17, he was probably 22. No, I think this guy Sam was older than that. And it was uh, it was a bunch of guys that hung out. But I'm thinking about him in particular. And he drove a Corvette, but he didn't have a job. And what his scam was, he worked half the year, and then the other half in those days, you would collect unemployment. Oh, yeah. You'd get a boss that would tell you, I'm going to lay you off for six months. You yeah. collect unemployment. Party and, cripples, and they used to call them by us. And then you'd either take book or sell coke, and that's a great living because you, you're clearing sixteen hundred a month already. You sell coke, make you know, and this guy would drive a Corvette. He was a piece of shit, or he wasn't a piece of shit. I mean, he probably was. He wasn't a piece of shit. He was. Uh, he didn't have no career. Is what right. I'm trying to say. He wasn't a role model. But his girlfriend owned the business, mm. and she had money. Yeah. And I remember how that appealed to me for about a month, and I was like, "There's no appeal in that. I want my own money." Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you learn through life. Like, for a month, he impressed me mm-hmm. that he had a girlfriend that paid the bills. Mm-hmm. But even at that early age, I was like, he don't you impress knew. me. Right. Because he ain't paying the fucking bills. Not that I could pay the bills at that time either. I couldn't right. pay no bills I was 40. But <clears throat> it's just crazy the people that you look at and you're impressed with. You know, it's like when you watch those fucking movies. Like, I was watching The United Empire was on. Mm-hmm. You ever watch Empire? It's mm-hmm. like the worst drug movie in the world. But it's it's on BET once a month. It's one of those movies that's always on between 7 and 9 when you got a spot at the store at 10.30. Oh, yeah. And you got no choice but to watch it because <laughs> there's nothing else on fucking TV. Yeah. It's either that or bull racing live from Bulgaria yeah. on ESPN <laughs> yeah. or some shit. And there's one scene where a guy goes up to him. Uh-huh. John Leguizamo's like a street drug dealer. Yeah. And he goes up to him. And he's like, "Hey, man, I, I really want to. Can I cut you a deal?" And he goes, "I want. I want this new PlayStation." Blah 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 blah. And he, John goes, "How much is it?" And he goes, "It's it's three hundred dollars." The kid goes, three hundred dollars." And the kid who wants the money the goes, he, "He goes, no, it's two hundred and ninety nine." <laughs> and Legazama goes, I'll give you the money, but you got to do stuff for me. Oh, yeah. You got to clean my car, so help me God. If you, you know, like he's telling him what he has to do when he mm-hmm. buys in the game and shit like that. You know, those kids grow up wanting to be a drug dealer. Oh, yeah, yeah. This right, because that's the first you, person that that's gets That's the first them. person who gets them. Yeah. Yeah, they, so, that's interesting. Your first influence, how does that, yeah, where that first influence is not your dad, how much that influences you. That's interesting. It's really weird. And it happens with comedy. It happens with anything that you, but it happens when you're a young man. Like yeah. It, I was confused as fuck as 21. At 21, I was confused as fuck. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't want to work. I wanted a fucking new car. I wanted money, and I wanted bitches, and I wanted coke. Wh- wh- where's the work, Joey? And sure. And what do you think? And I really thought that. The fucking blue bird of happiness is going to just drop it off at my door. Wow. Like, I, I can look you both in the eye right now and tell you, like, I had no idea about hard work. I wasn't a lazy person. Right. But I work. Who wants to work? <clears throat> yeah. Why don't I try to put something together so I can hang out at the bar in the daytime and I don't have to go to work? I mean, that was my deal from day one. Do as long as I didn't have to work in the daytime, yeah. I didn't give a fuck. Do you ever think that, like, you know, you wanted to... um you know, have like a, um, you know, like a, uh, do you ever think that you wanted to have a, fuck, man, I forgot I was going to ask you. You don't even smoke weed no more. You better get your shit together or start oh, smoking again. No, dude, I don't know what Jesus happened. Jesus fucking think- Christ. <laughs> this is what happens when you get sober. You get retarded. What'd you go to college for? To get stupid. 
That's like <laughs> fucking Michael Corleone and shit at the end of The Godfather. Damn, man. I couldn't have any idea coming to my head, man. No, I think it's funny how, yeah, what your influencers are, you know, the first person you see do this or that. But then, yeah, sometimes you are able to see past that. Like, yeah, there's some people, you know, we had this dude by us, <clears throat> like, you know, and this guy now runs a tree company, right? This guy, Senator Lawrence. And he he had a uh, dude. They used to do this thing where they had a lot of sinkholes. I grew up around a lot of sinkholes. You know, I mean, you'd have somebody you play hide and go seek, and somebody fucking you never find them. You know, you fucking you go knock like you know you go knock on somebody's door, and the next day their whole fucking house is gone. You know, it was like I grew up in a lot of Louisiana. Like half of it's sinking. You know, it's like a sinking environment. So where are you from in Louisiana exactly? Covington. Covington, Covington Louisiana. Where am I in Covington? Covington is about 50 miles north of New Orleans. That's it? Yeah. Did they get affected by Katrina? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Everybody lost their roofs. That's a big, like over there, they, the houses didn't fall down. People lost their roofs. So when you were growing up, what was Covington like? Was it a fucking deathbed? Was it a project's? Was it middle rain? No, Did it was dad, had... Your parents have a little bit of money. Enough to sustain. No, my dad was fucking old as fuck, dude. I think he was always sleeping on the couch. He used to go drink at this bar called Tony Padoni's, and he would take me over there during the day. And the lady would see how many chocolates I could put in my mouth. One of the bartenders back there, Big Janet, no, this fucking nice big sneakers? girl. Did you? Did you have nice clothes? You know, my mother around? dressed us poorly, man. I don't know where she learned to dress, like out of an Indian shop and like were, a Native you, American did catalog. Need, did you something. need for shoes? Did you need shirts? No. It wasn't like you lived off hand-me-downs or anything. So Covington is not like, you know, some fucking neighborhood that's, you know, where your dog is missing. No, I lived all, like, I got hand-me-down clothes, but I didn't get hand-me-down shoes. Like, every year my mother got us a pair of shoes, you know. Um, my mom did the holidays. What did your mom do for a living? Delivery. She Delivery delivered what? Newspapers, cookies, <laughs> magazines. What about your dad? They used to have a magazine called News on Wheels. You remember that magazine? You could go to the dime store or whatever, or the gas station my dad didn't do anything oh, I, oh you know what my dad used to do actually this is funny he used to go to the gas he used to go to colleges remember what they had to do to the colleges that would sign people up for credit cards you know some fucking old dude barking over there throwing frisbees at kids and shit you know so that my dad had that job <clears throat> this towards the end of his life my parents weren't together anymore but my dad had that job, and he would take me there with him. He'd let me drive him. I'm 12 years old, right? I had a little growth spurt. I was that 5'10", that fucking lean bad boy, you know, ligaments only, son. Dude, sometimes it wasn't even bones. Part of me was just ligaments reaching out and hoping that the marrow caught up. You know, that's the kind of guy I was. What did your dad do for a living before I don't. Uh, he used to be like a travel agent. You know, he did a lot of crew. Like, uh, he would sign people up for cruises and stuff between... Um, Puerto Vallarta, where's that at? Mexico. Yeah, between Mexico and America. Well, you and got a D in geography. Yeah, Central America. Jesus yeah. Christ, what I got to deal with? <laughs> Bro, I walk in this room, dude, I fucking can't think of nothing. You don't know what Puerto Vallarta is. Even I know that, and I'm a dumb fuck. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there in Central America, and he would uh, he was like a travel agent, I guess. What did he do when he was young? He wrote for the newspaper. You know, he had a family. He, you know, he was kind of European in a lot of ways. He liked to be, you know, he worked with the church. He liked to do a lot of, um, he liked to just sit at like the coffee place and talk, you know. I think he drank a good bit. How do you feel about religion at this point in your life? I need a, I need a higher power, you know. And, I, you know, for what, me. What were you raised? I was raised probably Christian, you okay. know, for definitely. I mean, but nothing heavily. I just always wanted there to be a higher power, you know. Uh, I used to pray at night and that sort of thing. But, you know, now I just need there to be a higher power because I want to have faith. I, you know, otherwise I feel like you feel alone a lot. There Stop you go. <laughs> hit him with that power. fucking Christmas hitter, bro. That fucking. I'm going to throw water on you. That's that fucking power right there. That fucking booty Boy, star of David, bro. At least <laughs> fucking damn. This stuff is tremendous. That air calamari, bro. You hit him is. with it. God damn. I can't son. even imagine I can't what this is. from New York. Fucking hit oh, this protein bro. powder. That's right. The, the other protein <laughs> sure powder. Is, so dude. This is straight it's up. You've been fucking... drinking aqua velva, son. Yeah. That shit is fucking damn. This is straight. I got the vanilla on it. I switched it up. I switched it up. I'm it's switching, the worst. Uh, you ever I'm accidentally buy strawberry? 
You ever accidentally buy strawberry? No, fucking, no, no. Oh, no, that's man. the worst. You get home. They got Mexican chocolate and the vanilla. Oh, dude. And the yeah. Mexican chocolate's <laughs> off the hook. And the vanilla's dude, you, not bad either, but I switched to vanilla today. The Mexican chocolate, and you that, reach in for the scoop and a knife fucking pops the, out the of the fucking, fucking like, like Carrie yeah. at the end of Carrie when she grabs a head through the rocks. What's the matter? Dude, but this guy. What do you mean, what's the matter? You, you fucking farted on me three times in 30 minutes. You're inhaling uh, it through your mouth. Yeah, make a wish. Yeah, I don't want to smell it. You don't want to smell it, but Calm it's called down, into your dude. lungs. What am I supposed to breathe? <laughs> you might just whiff for this. No. Come on, bro. Just yeah. Take a little whiff for this. Dude, that's enough, no, bro. All about. Three parts, you're out. You're this, fucking this blowing this protein. dude out. His eyes are starting to fucking heat up. <laughs> Look at him, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lee, man. I feel like I'm being rude to you. No, nah, don't be You're rude. fine. Lee okay. loves all this shit. Yeah. If there's an opening in that wheelbarrow, go get that wheelbarrow. And it's got pillars in it, too. That'd be nice. And I put you out there under a lamp like a So nice. how old were you when you were driving your dad to campus? To- Dude, I was 12 years old. So that put him at 80? Yeah, he was 82. So he would drive, and he'd sleep on the way there. I'd stop at my buddy's house, dude, as long as he was resting. Because I, I, I was fucking showing off. I had a Delta 88 suddenly. My friends are still, you know, going through adolescence, you know, inside trying to, you know, blow a flute to get their dick to fucking get taller, you know, like they see on those commercials in India. And fucking here I am pulling up, you know, in a, in a Cutlass and a Delta 88. I'd go in. I'm like, bro, shh, come out, get in the back seat. Let's go for a ride, right? So my buddy Scott get back there, and we would just fucking cruise around, dude. My dad's sleeping, bro. And here was the thing. My dad's neck was real bad, so even if he woke up, I would just tell Scott, keep it quiet back there for a minute, you know? I'll just tell him we're lost or getting gas or something. And then my dad would go back to sleep, and I'd cruise around a little more and then take my buddy back. I mean, dude, at 12, 13 years old, a friend picking you up? We pulled up with a sleeping senior citizen, dude. People <laughs> thought that we were fucking, you know, kidnappers, bro. Senior citizen hey, kidnappers. Out, you're blowing pots in the yeah, yeah, while he's sleeping no. and shit. I think maybe we smoked a cigarette, but then one time, bro. <laughs> dude, one time I do remember this. I'm driving back from Hammond, Louisiana. And, oh, so this is how I kind of got in. I don't know if it's how I got into comedy, but this is the first time I ever really spoke in front of people. <laughs> My dad would get people to sign up for the credit cards. And he got a dollar fifty from the company, whatever, any college kid that signed up. And now, if, looking back, it's like getting college kids to sign up for a credit card. He probably started half of the fucking, you know, you know, he probably ruined a lot of people's young lives. That's what they do, credit card <laughs> companies. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's they, what do. they do. That's what they want to do. They want to tangle you up at nineteen. Right. As soon as you take that first student loan, you get a credit card. Yeah, that's true. It's automatic. You get your name goes on a list. You're eligible. So I'd be on the table. My dad would have me on the table, and people come over, and I would start barking at them, getting them to come over, you know. Hey, you, you know. You know, guy with the nice haircut or something. Or the black girls, a lot of times, you know, they have all the extra hair. You know what I'm talking about? You'd have a girl of a fucking rope swing hanging off the side of her fucking head. You know, you got summer campers swinging off the back and jumping into a river. You know how black girls have that long extra hair. And you'd see them and you'd be like, hey, you know, and be sweet to them and have them come over. And and you would make friends and you would be entertaining and you'd get them to come over. And then my dad would try and sign them up for the credit card, you know? <clears throat> you know what's crazy? Theo, you just made me remind me of something. It's so weird how people say it like that chick <laughs> that people don't know that chick Flo. Mm-hmm. That that girl that got all those commercials. With, oh, yeah. I saw, I saw her at, at an audition one day. And it's funny that Flo was packed up. And getting ready to leave this town. And she booked that campaign. Now she's a gazillionaire. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's so weird that Josh Wolf left Seattle in September. He's a funny guy. Of 96. <laughs> what a nice guy, too, huh? And my plan was for him to come down. At that time, we were very tight. And my plan was for him to come down, check out the waters, and then I would come down in eight or nine months. And once I made that decision, Mm -hmm. like all these opportunities started opening up for me. The first one being I got this job. So he went first. He came first in September of 96. He left his girlfriend up there, and I lived in the back house. And she was pregnant. So he came down here first to get them set up. So I lived lived in his back guest house. With just you and a lady there? Was that scary And they had kids. No, they had kids. Oh, they had children I watched the kids, and I was tight with her. She was a great lady. She still did. Okay. 
I just haven't seen her in a long time. We were dear friends. Yeah, because he's married to a different woman now, Bethany. Yeah, yeah, completely different. I never met his first wife. So he came down first. And right away, I got this job with yeah. this company that I know people and I know shit. This was like shit. Like a cigarette company? No, this was shit. This was a shit idea. And they paid me $15 an hour plus bonuses. This is 1996. Jesus. Which is 20 years Pretty ago. Pretty good money. 21 years ago. That's great money. And what it was was calling pizza parlors mm -hmm. across the country and getting them to sign up for a service that at halftime, it was a chain. That's what it was. That's what it was. It was Domino's Pizza. It was a scam? Nope. Domino's Pizza had cut a deal with the NFL. Mm -hmm. That during a game, if a Domino sign came up on your screen, you got a dollar off a of pizza. Mm. But to get that deal... You had a sign like Domino would make its affiliates pay. So I had to call those affiliates mm -hmm. and make them pay that extra money to get. Th so what it would do is as soon as they called Domino's, mm -hmm. that number, it would go to whatever Domino's paid. I see. This was a scam inside of Domino's. Right. It was like, yeah. I worked I for a Domino's affiliate that was calling Domino's and saying, listen, we're starting a new program starting August 14th. Yeah. And here's the deal. Every time people watch an NFL game, there's going to be a domino banner on the side. It's going to say, call now and get $2. Oh, off yeah, I remember that. A fresh delivered pizza. And they if showed a hot pizza on the if screen. If you don't s sign up for that, the calls won't go to your pizza joint. Right. The calls will go to the pizza joint in fucking uh, North Hollywood and Van Nuys instead of North Hollywood. Oh, it was I really see. shitty to see what the corporation was doing from within, but I didn't give a fuck. Right. Yeah, you're not, get, you can't I, fight that battle. I could sell like a motherfucker. Right. So I was pulling down. I was pulling down 1200 a week growth Jesus. out of there. Bringing home nine. Bro, how, why do you ever quit that? 35 hours a week, like 10 to fucking four, like something easy. This is what I'm saying. I quit that job. A step Because one night at the fucking underground, a guy approached me. And he goes, hey, man. At John's you, Club? Have you ever been uh, the, the old county underground? At John Fox's old Yeah, one. John Fox's old, man. That's, That's a great room. This is No, no. This is 95. This is a completely different room. It was different? This was on the Swannies, yeah. And some guy came up to me, and he goes, hey, man, did you ever sell before? And I go, yeah. You know, I sell whatever. And he gave me a job selling phones. Mm -hmm. That was just too good to be like sure. Like pay phones? pay phones so i would sell phones and advertising for newspapers at the mm -hmm. same time you know me dog i'm a scam i don't give I a buy fuck. a phone from you right now anything not to fucking have a day job yeah so i would hang out by the train station mm -hmm. and i would either sell you a subscription for the seattle times mm -hmm. or i would ask you do you have a cell phone i would take the cell oh, phone cell right phones there. cell phone and he gave me a cell phone with unlimited minutes no in 1997 yeah you were that king. was part of it and if you call, like an you got, if the guy was giving me, like, for every line that I opened, mm -hmm. the guy would give me, like, 400 bucks. And he was getting, like, 1600 at this time. Gee. <coughs> he told me the truth. He was How way out of the How are they making that much money? Because if somebody bought a phone and got a line, the company this is 97 before people were having a lot of this phones. right yeah this yeah so cell phones cell phones this yeah the cell phones were a little bigger yeah i didn't shit. get a cell phone until a cell phone until 2000 so if you signed up there was a kickback and the guy would give me a kickback <sighs> it's a huge kickback. i was going over there every day and giving him seven eight numbers and he would close three or four of them wow and I would stand the mall i can't believe it. i just remembered that way i would stand at the mall at either and what, the buy Ever stuff? Everett Mall. No, I wouldn't buy dick. I would be that guy, that annoying guy. Oh, at oh Everett no Mall. way. When it was raining, I would go to the Everett the body Mall. body scrub? No, and I would sell fucking subscriptions to either the Washington Post, the Seattle yeah. Times. Oh, yeah. Or a fucking cell phone. And the cell phone was paying me fucking, it was just amazing. Yeah. The guy would show up every Saturday at, at the fucking underground and give me fifteen hundred. Jeez, it was like Jesus fucking intervened. I can't even imagine. So the whole month of December, I was making money. 
So then, did you even want to come and do comedy then once you got that money? I would have kept that. No, I kept, I needed that money. I was paying child support. I was paying an attorney. I was in fucking so much debt. It was coming out of my eyes. Plus, I was snorting blow. But now I'm making six, seven thousand a month selling fucking cell phones in a mall every fucking day. And now Doug Stanhope comes for New Year's and I open up for him and he talks me into moving to LA. Really? So my point is that it's really weird how places trick you. Right when you say to the universe, I'm gonna leave, you get the best job in the fucking oh, world. Yeah. When I left Seattle, I was pulling down sixteen hundred a week just selling cell phones. Never mind fucking blow. <sighs> Subscriptions to the Seattle Times. If I had nothing to do, I just yeah, go to the you train had all your station. pussy lined up. All I, your no, food. I lived with a stripper. I lived oh, with a girl Jesus. that made money, and she I paid split the rent with her. We lived in a fucking we we lived we all in a, fucking or not? No, no. We she stripped and she was Christian, so <laughs> I slept in de- different beds like fucking the Dick Van Dyke show. Oh. We lived in a fucking RV. We lived in an RV at a place where you back your RV up. Yeah. They connect it. Oh, you yeah. You get cable TV. You got, you had a shower in your RV, or they had an athletic center. This place was tremendous. Jesus you had, Christ. Oh, my God. It was there for 20 years. It was like a lodge. KOA or something? It was like a, no, yeah. it was a little bigger. It had a bigger name, a better reputation. Yeah. Bro, they had restaurants. KOA was crazy, bro. You walk in, they had three or four restaurants <laughs> in there, like <laughs> yeah. real restaurants. They had a gym, a pool, showers, what was it? a movie theater in Kent, Washington, where fucking, uh, you know who was, who was living in Kent, Washington at the time? Henry Hill. No way. Henry Hill was living probably. I was going to guess he Jeffrey a, Dahmer. So Wasn't he from there? Kent, no, he's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Fucking. Uh, I'm thinking I'm living of, um, in Kent, Washington at a fucking RV park. Yeah. With the stripper in an RV and a dog. What a lucky guy. And Midway Mobile Villas? I don't know the fuck. A mobile mansion? This <laughs> guy trying to sell you the neighborhood place, over here. Unbelievable. We would wake up in the morning, <laughs> walk into the building, we'd brush our teeth. I'd give her a stab and we'd walk into the building. Wow. We'd eat two eggs, sunny side up eggs, like nothing at the diner. Jesus. They had a diner in there. Then we'd go back to the thing, watch yeah. TV for a while. I'd write comedy. And then we'd both go into the gym. I would fitness. swim. Yeah, I would I swim. Because that. that's how you had to take a shower. You took a shower because you had to work that's out. A place, yeah. In those days, I was homeless. So for me to take a shower, I'd have to work out. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'd work out twice a day. I was tip top fucking Magoo. Magoo I, I love that. When I moved to LA, I was in great shape. It's what happened to me. I fell apart. With Once I got here, I stopped doing everything. But, dude, so now, and I'm thinking about this while you're telling me that. So I'm like, you know, that when you say, so when you, when, when you start to tell the world or, you know, you tell, like, the powers in the world the that you're going to move, the universe. Move. When you tell the universe that you're going to move, that that's when the universe, like, starts to give you things to keep you they there. They throw curveballs at you. Right. They throw curveballs so at you. So then you got to be somebody that then you, I mean, that's like, that's kind of, is that the difference between some people and other people you think? That you, you're willing to just say, okay, look. These are great things, but I'm gonna still move away from this and take my chance. That because some people would just stay. Do you think like there's something inherent in certain types of people that are then like, okay, I'm gonna put this on the line and still move? There are people that will come to me and say to me, Joey, I'm a comic. I'm moving. To, I'm putting away money and moving to LA in two years. Mm-hmm. That guy's dead. That guy's dead. Yeah. That's never going to happen. You got to build it somewhere else. That's no. Is that what you're saying? When you have the urge to make a move, you have to make a move. Oh, I see what you're saying. The people who procrastinate that move will give you a reason why. Yeah. They're looking for something to fall on their lap so they don't have to move. Oh, I see. And they're going to give themselves a two-year span. So they give themselves a two-year span. And what happens? You meet some fat chick, you knock her up. Yeah. Now your dream is quashed because you got married, so you gave yourself an out. Yeah. Sometimes in life, we give ourselves our own out. Yeah. But sometimes the universe gives you an out, and you have to take advantage of it. You know, the universe will give you signals. Yeah. They'll tell you signs. You know, if I yeah. come up to you, if a bouncer has to come up to you and tap you on the shoulder and tell you it's time to leave, yeah. you fucked up. Yeah. You know when to put the drink down and get out and walk out of there. Yeah. You know this because you're an adult. And because you've seen how people have acted. 
once a town, like, I've overstayed my welcome. Yeah. And because I've overstayed my welcome, I realize when it's time to go. Right. When it's time to go, it's time it's to time go. It's time to go. I know when it's time to go. I'm the king of knowing when it's time to go. <laughs> Some, there was a place I used to rob constantly. I used to work there and rob constantly. Yeah. I knew I couldn't do it anymore because I was going to get caught and my reputation and my life was going to be shit again. Mm -hmm. I forced myself to quit. I took a 50% pay cut. Yeah, because you were stealing, right? Because I was stealing. Yeah. But I knew eventually I would get caught. There was wow. no, because that's the way life oh. is. You drinking water I'm ain't gonna help. You. Oh, smell that fart! That's a dude. tremendous fucking. You guys fart. are like a married couple, dude. No, no one would this say married. This is sex in your sixties. This is what sex in your sixties is like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> huffing somebody's fucking booty, <laughs> huffing that, <laughs> huffing that little booty falcon, bro. <laughs> Look at poor Lee. He's been sniffing farts. He doesn't know that fart's sinking into his T-shirt. But dude, I didn't even tell you, Joey. I forgot to tell you. So the man, we in our area, they had a lot of sinkholes, right? Because Louisiana's eight feet underwater, brother. If you look at New Orleans, that city is eight feet under. It's below sea level. So here's the ocean, right? Then there's naturally a bottom, and that's where they built New Orleans. You know, that's so that's why it always floods constantly there. So it's soggy everywhere around, like our whole area. Louisiana is a swamp, you know. But they had a um, a company for land when they wanted to build, and before they had, you know, now they got the surveyors. You see a dude out there in the morning, you think he's a pedophile. He's taking pictures of children or something, but he's looking for di distance with the land with the orange vest. They made him put an orange vest on because everybody thought they was, you know, touching children or looking for children. And now, but before that, they had they would hook a fucking rope to you. Oh, you fucking giving him, huh? You fucking got a whiff of that. That bird is hatching, baby, oh, in your fucking something. brain. He's boy. getting the core of the asshole. Oh. What this poor kid is taking oh, tonight. Dude, that Mother kid. Earth right there. I'm sitting here, it's, they're my farts. I'm thinking of running out of here. Oh, damn, boy, that fart had yeah, breast that's, milk oh, yeah. in it, huh? The, the that thing one, is fucking. There's one that's percolating oh, in my damn, asshole right wow. now. That's going to come out like that Korean scent. Oh, you know what yeah. Saying? That's that fucking lunch animal. And I make it ricochet off the chair. Oh, beautiful. So it, go, it ricochets <laughs> off the nine corner ball and it goes right into his nose. He gets them. Nobody knows how to fart like I've been farting like this for 50 fucking years. Oh, wow. I know how to point my hips. Oh, yeah. I know how to bank them off the back of the back. I know how to. You know, oh, I'll yeah. Fart, first, You're the I'll Robert Parrish of fucking. I fart travel buttholes. three feet per second. Yeah. So I could even bang it off the wall like a like a pool table right here. There's a certain cut that I eliminate. Man, the I'm chair. getting hot. Oh yeah, you open the door a little bit. That that's warm air that's coming out of my asshole. It's real. Oh, yeah, that is. It's real. That's that, that's how that warm is you, dude. Your ass might be really fucking hot. Bro. Oh shit! Look at Cleo taking off the shirt and shit. Fucking ass, man. Who's Cleo? Leo, <laughs> Cleo, Cleo, Cleo. I don't fucking know. Come on, man. I smoke twenty farts. Look, I've inhaled twenty farts and I smoke twenty yeah. bonnets. Bro, don't be such a hard. Don't be so hard on them, bro. Where I'm from, you get two letters right in somebody's name. That fucking counts, dude. <laughs> if they don't respond after that, if you get one letter right. I just thought about Cleo. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, dude, so they would put kids on. They This is when they used to put kids on chains, and they'd have them for fucking. What? Yeah. <laughs> they'd have them walk out into a field and see if the fucking earth fell under them. That's, when I, that's the that, area I was in. No one ever did that to kids. Oh, yeah, they definitely did. Look it up. I was. What am I supposed look to look it up? up. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Searching You're the for, wizard over there. For, searching for sinkholes. Fucking Seth Buttons over there. You're the wizard, bro. No. Type it in. No, I'm sorry, no, Lee. No, no, I'm no, being no, rude. Don't look for that shit. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't. Fucking look for kids tied up looking for sinkholes. Why are you listening to him for? What's wrong with you? He's fucking with you. I'm not fucking with him, man. They don't tie no kids up. Next thing you know, they didn't tie. It wasn't like you were kidnapped. This is the fucking forties when they used to tie <laughs> Chinese people up. Out. They would tie Chinese people up and throw them over the cliff with a stick of dynamite, and that's how they built the railroads. These fucking -uh. yeah, man. Really? The Chinese built the railroads oh. in this fucking country, and that's how they would test it to see if it was good land. They'd make them go over the cliff with a stick of dynamite and a rope or some shit, something fucking creepy. Jesus. That's why I don't think they were using white kids to see if there were sinkholes. They had to be like from other countries or something like that. No. They didn't have any kids from other countries, boss. Black kids, that was it. 
and they weren't using them to do that. But they would have kids, man. It wasn't a day. I mean, you wouldn't. It's not like you're falling into fucking, you know, into like Hades or anything. You would just fall like six or eight feet, you know. That's enough. Some guy fell two weeks ago into a den of <laughs> rattlesnakes. No. You had to kill three rattlesnakes. Did you see it on Eyewitness News? <laughs> Oh, yeah, he came out with blood and rattlesnake bites. Sounds, all this that fucking, sounds like a halfway house this, in Albuquerque. This whole fucking sure? town. I'm sure right here up in the valley somewhere. This whole fucking town. You could be walking and fall into a sinkhole. Some guy fell into a sinkhole in his front yard and no. he was swimming in shit. He oh, fell right into that fucking shit idiot, pond. Bro. That tank see, of shit in front of your house. Dude, I could feel it in my legs if I'm near a sinkhole, dude. No joke. I could feel it in my legs. And that's from growing up in that area, man. You, I swear to God, you know, like, you know how senior citizens know, like, in their spine, their spine will rattle if it's going to rain. Right. Like, you could feel that in, in your legs, man. Growing up where I grew up, you could feel if the ground is, uh, you know, so, going to be solid or going to, you know, start to give way. I mean, you got to understand how, how soggy it is in Louisiana, man. You guys are, it's soggy, man. You know? The whole state. The whole state. You build, dude, you fucking build a doghouse in the morning. It's fucking 30 feet away. You know? So what I see in the news all the time is really like it, it rains a lot in Louisiana. There's oh, a whole yeah. Baton Rouge, Monroe. Yeah. All those towns. And the rains. water just, yeah, the, it's so right there on the sea level. You know, we're probably above sea level right here, I bet. See, we check and see how, what we are, Lee. Do you mind looking no. where we are? Above sea level in... Just even if you put like Los Angeles, Studio City, Studio City, we're not even we're, we're not we're up a little bit, not you know Colorado up, but we're up. Yeah, you know what? You know up. what scares me about Louisiana? Well, New Orleans as a whole. Did they prepare it for another Katrina? I don't think that when they, they did. rebuilt it, did they fucking repair it? Like, did they really? No, I don't think they. When did. you go back there, do you see anything different? I mean, I still hear that there's places that are just done. From Katrina, there's still areas that are done. They rebuilt a lot, but did they rebuild it to withstand? Because Katrina's Katrina storms are just going to get stronger, right? And every year we're going to get killed at one location, whether it be Galveston, Houston, yeah. you know, Tampa, Florida. It could be one certain location. Yeah, it's going to eventually go back to New Orleans, and it's going to be worse than Katrina. It's usually off Claiborne I mean, in New Orleans, most people. But I don't know what happened. They had. They, uh, I mean, if it was in the sinkhole already after Katrina, I would have knocked that shit down, filled it with right. more dirt, 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 dirt. You know, yeah, that's the obvious. The mayor got put in jail. Ray the, Nagin went to jail. He went to jail. The chocolate badger or so, something. So that, what they means, that means that the money didn't get used for funds because, right, every mayor of Louisiana always went to jail. Right, when he's all stealing, they're all stealing. Morial, yeah. all of the dudes have always gone to jail. From New Orleans? Yeah. Are they all corrupt? Yeah. yeah. Edwin Edwards, he was the governor of Louisiana, but he was super corrupt. That dude, they well, yeah, it's just a corrupt place, man. It's just like kind of, you know, it's like pirates and shit. It's a little bit. It's like Tampa, but they build a whole state out of it. No, is gambling a lot in Louisiana? Yeah. You got gambling right there in New Orleans. You got all the boats, and you got Harris has a land casino, the only one allowed. And they showed that New Orleans when they got hammered, that they showed that Harris. Oh yeah. And they showed the comic that was there. They did. No, that the comic that was there during the, Katrina. The billboard was sideways. He was a comedy store guy. Oh wow! Really? His name was uh, James Stevens the Third. Wow. And he was at that casino that week. That'd be interesting and to get his take on it. Showed Katrina when they showed New Orleans. They showed Harris mm. sign sideways with his name on it. And that's why. So it was just really interesting. If they, I haven't been to New Orleans since I. I've been to New Orleans two times. And the second time was a lot better than the first time. Yeah. The first time is one of the most un uncomfortable situations I've ever been in, in comedy. Wow! Really. I took my grandma blow, and I got in the car and drove back to Houston that night. Yeah, that's everybody's story. In the the hotel there. was kind of a little weird. The people were a little weird. When I went back to shoot grudge match, mm -hmm. since I didn't have to go to those weird spots. It was more comfortable. It was more comfortable. They put me in a hotel that was, it was a home. They served three meals a day. Oh, wow, the B&B. And, &B. and it was, the food was delicious. Oh, I yeah. got first like, ugh. The food was out of this fucking world, man. Wow. I don't know what the name of the hotel was. Hmm. You know, you had your own floor, 
Wow. Fucking tremendous. I still remember sitting in the living room, like in the dining room. Mm -hmm. Like it was like the last supper table. Mm -hmm. And here I am all by myself. They gave me the whole floor. Yeah. So you had to use a card and press the thing. And there was maybe three or four floors, five floors. I think, uh, was it almost downtown, a little bit off the city kind of? It was a little bit off the city. Yeah. And it had a, the, the, you had to be downstairs from seven to nine. To eat. 12 to two or five to seven to eat dinner. To eat. And they had two or three things on the menu. And there was no choice. If you picked one thing, it came with a soup, salad. Yeah. It was fucking superb. Wow. And I know that the one night we had a party and I went to the club and it was superb. It wasn't as dirty as I had been the first time. Yeah. When I went to New Orleans the first time, it had to be 99, 98. What was New Orleans is out of its fucking mind. When was uh, Katrina? 2000. Uh, no, no, no. 2006. When I went to New Orleans in 98 to do comedy that time, I took a fallout. Mm hmm. It was either 98 or 99. And, dog, I got to tell you something. From the minute I parked the car to the minute I walked to the hotel to walk into the gig, I thought I was going to get jacked. Yeah. I'm fucking my, you know, A lot of I've, I've jacked people. Right. So I felt like I was going to get jacked. You got the feeling. Even the street lights are fucking telling there you, were you people, about to get fucked there up? There was people at every corner. It was lookouts. Yeah, people bumping into you, and years later they made that movie Focus about pickpockets, and then when they when they, when they go to the Super Bowl in New Orleans, wow. and I thought about that movie, how that day I saw pickpockets. Yeah, too many people bumping into you. A lot of brothers, a lot Bulgarians. Of, a lot of brothers with bad intentions, you know. Yeah, the uh, black on black crime there, especially at late at night, it's crazy, man. The drug situation, yeah, reminded me like. I'm walking, and some guy comes up to like I, you know, listen. You go to New Orleans, you got to go downtown and yeah. see it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not. Yeah, you got to go to the French Quarter. Quarter. You got to go. You got to take a walk down yeah. there. So we got into town, maybe two, checked into the hotel, and went right down there. Yeah. And, I mean, I wasn't on that block a minute, and mm -hmm. I got a flash out back to 42nd Street. Yeah. In the 70s, where people, are, yeah, come in, yeah, come you know, in. I got I'm coke. Not, I'm not drinking. Yeah. So I'm looking and I'm like making believe like I'm having a good time. And there's tons of people on the street, and right away some guy came up to me. Oh yeah. So what are you looking for, player? They'll have a baby carriage full and of I fucking was like, co uh, cocaine. I don't cocaine. know what you got. Yeah. And he goes, I got this, I got this, I got this. I go, let's get some cocaine. Let's see what you got. And he goes, man, I got cocaine. I'll make you dance and shit. Yeah. He goes, stand right here. My player will come over and talk to you. Give him the money, then I'll come back. And, and it's all of that shit. And I was like, and you game get out, murdered at the game end. Game out. Yeah. And, That's uh, how it always is, and yeah. that happens a lot. And, and I have, saw it. I mean, I saw it within four minutes. Yeah, I but a lot of it. idiots won't see it. Well, they're tourists. tourists. They're looking for drugs, and they want it fast, they get nasty, and they're just gonna yeah. get robbed. They I do went, that shit, man. I went back to the hotel room, and when I got to the club, the doorman asked me, "Yeah, you need anything while you're here? What are you talking about? You're like, I got weed, I got powder. Like, well, give me a gram of powder. Everything. It was beautiful. Yeah, I took it to the hotel room. I did the line, and even the front desk people. Mm -hmm. I thought we're gonna rob me. Like everybody there, just seems so fucking fucked up. It seems like a movie. I mean, I there's a lot. I tell you what fucked me up. They knocked on my door. Well, as soon as I got to the hotel room, mm -hmm. oh, I went that's to the bathroom. Shady. I took a piss. I washed my hands. I took the coke out. I chopped it up. I opened up a beer. Mm -hmm. I took like two sips out of the beer. I had a yeah. six pack with me. Mm -hmm. I did a line of coke, dog. One little line. Mm -hmm. I put the coke away, and the door knocked. And when I opened it, the guy was like, oh, man, I'm just checking up on you, making yeah. sure you're okay. And I was like, the fuck are you doing? Okay. Yeah. We're adults. I what closed are you checking the door, up bro. On the coke hit me a little bit, but not enough to make me paranoid or fuck me up. Yeah. I called the other comic. I said, dog, what are you doing? He goes, nothing. I go, you feel like driving home? He goes, I don't want to spend the night here either. Wow. We both got in the car and I left and that was my. And I never forget walking back to the car. It was 1130 and all I could smell was fucking vomit. Yeah. Oh, if you're down by the French Quarter, stuff is gross. Like the, the, <clears throat> it smelled like. Fuck. But they're redoing it now. They're redoing the streets Did down you go, there. When I called you last week, you were in New Orleans. I was in Baton Rouge. Oh, you were in Baton Rouge. I thought you were in New Orleans. But dude, even in Baton Rouge, man, I'm out there. We're taking the kids. I got nieces and nephews, you know, and they're little tigers and all kinds of shit, you know, costumes. And we're taking them, and you'd have, you know, a couple, you know, brothers running by, like I got coke, you know, I got coke, and it's we're out there fucking taking the kids, like. 
trick or treat, you know. I got Molly, what you need? Like, what the fuck, dude? I'm already, you know, they got the kid dressed up like a damn mountain lion. I'm not doing a bunch of coke at the house, you know. Yeah, it reminded me of Times Square. Like, they were just pitching, barking at you. And I got coke. I got fucking drywall. One guy, dude had drywall. I'm like, I'm not was, fucking buying that at night. The guy I was with that was driving was like a nice feature act. Like, he was like Lee. Yeah. And he was petrified. I don't even think he's in the business. Does anymore. Lee open for you now? No. No, 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 no. Right. No, no, no. I'm talking about this guy had been doing it for like 10 years, eight years. Yeah. He had a day job mm, yeah. and stuff. And he drove me and he was like, he didn't do drugs, he didn't drink, he had a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. He was like Christian. And I remember even at the comedy. He was day, scared? He didn't feel good. Yeah. He, he didn't like it. The yeah. gig was like a once a month thing. Mm -hmm. And it got it's nine drunk country. people. Yeah. Got nine drunk people, bro. It didn't even get an audience. They paid you, and I heard maybe a month later they canceled it. Yeah, every time that happens in Louisiana. They don't want comedy, man. They don't want comedy. Because they like to hear the story. Baton Rouge, they, they do. Baton Rouge had a Baton funny Rouge, bump I used to go years. to Mike, Mike, what's his name, had a club down there. My oh. buddy Tommy Pancos was the DJ over there, and then he ended up being the GM for a while. At the Funny Bone. Yeah. That's where I, I started. I was there when the girl was there. Chris Titus's girlfriend was the man. Oh no, that's Shreveport. That's oh, is that Shreveport? Yeah. Okay. Does Baton Rouge still have a club? Baton Rouge doesn't. How about Shreveport? It moved over to Bozier across the river over to Bozier City. I opened up for Dave Attell there one time, and Tommy, uh, fucking Andy Dick tried to blow me at the casino there. Right then, how about this? Three years later, I'm back there again. Andy Dick's there shooting something again. Offered to blow me at the casino. He forgot he'd offered me three years earlier, and I told him no. What a small world, you know? What did he say to you? How did somebody offer this? Such he had thing? a girl. He had a little hitman. So he'd bait you with that pussy and then switch it out for his own wiener. Well, how and that he, was like his move, you know? He'd send the girl over. Yeah, you want to come do something wild or something? And then you'd come over, you know, and you'd like be thinking about her pussy or thinking about her tits or something. <laughs> and while you're doing that, he, suddenly he's there and then they're talking about like a threesome or something and then she goes to get you know get something get drinks or get a salad or something and then you're fucking sitting there and it's just you and him you know and you're like fuck this shit man you know i'm not doing this i'm not fucking out here looking for sinkholes for fucking two dollars an hour you know oh, you should have called me a fucking decade ago bro and tied a chain to my back that you know fuck you to that too Oh. He'll fuck you to that, bro. He'll fuck child. you like a B. Sean on fucking on meth, bro. He got arrested again recently, did he not? Did he? I don't know. He's got a beautiful yeah, son though. His son is a fun, is a nice kid. Sonny uh, Lucas or whatever his name is. I How think. do you know him through comedy? Yeah, I met the son through comedy. Because the son of a of a always tries to do comedy as well. Andy Lucas Dick is his name. He's a he's super nice kid. He's actually pretty funny. I don't know if he still does it or not. Yeah, in July. And I'm not judging. I don't know if he, everybody's funny in their own world. Sexual battery. What's sexual battery? I don't know, dude, but I could fucking add two charges to it, I'm sure. Yep. Bro. I'll tell you that, dude. I mean, they were AAA batteries. I saw his dick, bro. It's nothing to fucking even look at. Too? Yeah. He showed me it, dude. Oh, and I didn't look for a long time. I'll tell you that, bro. No, dude, it was the kind of dick you could see in one glance. Like some dicks, you got to be like, oh, you got to almost look at both sides to see the real. You know, to see the whole city, but this thing, it was a little township, bro. It was something they'd have in South Africa out in the Soweto villages or something. Like I said, when I was a young man, a guy tried to, in a car, tried to grab my dick. That's one thing. Yeah. But a guy taking mm -hmm. his dick out, I don't know what I would do. I think you just walk away, man. Or you say something crazy, you know? I wasn't like, I'm not like a, if somebody wants to be wild and they're on drugs, I'm not a violent, you know? Here's what works for me. No, I'm out, bro. You know, I don't do all the party meat and all of that. So. There's a certain element of your manhood. There's a certain element yeah. of your manhood. You know, that one day you decide what you, what you are and what you're not going to do. Okay? Yeah. I have nothing, again, nothing, whether you want to be a transgender if you want to be gay, I have nothing about your yeah. sexual orientation. If you want to play for the fucking Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I don't give a fuck. But, okay, even Boogie Nights. You've seen Boogie Nights. Yeah. You've seen Only Boogie saw Nights. it once, though. Okay, there's a scene where uh, the heroin boy 
buys a new car and he calls Marky Wahlberg to see it. And the guy makes out with him. Mm -hmm. And Marky Marky Wahlberg goes, what the fuck happened? And he doesn't really know. know. It's tricky. That shit to me, like, I would know what I'd do. Like, if somebody went to make out with me. Yeah. Like, I would know what to do. What if they were, like, a world champion of something? I still wouldn't know what to do. Like, dude, if some fucking, you know, some guy who sells, you know, salads or something Listen, is trying to make me out. looking at you on a line of coke and going, you know what, Theo? Yeah. I don't know if you know this. I switch sides from time to time. I think you're very handsome. Right. I think you would say to me, Joey, you're my dog and I love you. But you and me can't bat that way. I don't do yeah. that shit. I think you'd be mad at me for a week. You'd tell a couple of your friends. But then over the years, we'd forget about it. That's one thing. If we were coked up at 5 in the morning and I came clean with you, that I banged a couple guys from time to time. Yeah. I'm married. I got a wife. But I'm bisexual. That's one yeah. thing. But for me to be snorting coke with you at your house, yeah. and also I go to the bathroom, and I come out and you're naked on your couch, Hunting for I got to fuck you up. Yeah. I got to at least smack you in the face. Yeah. To make you, I don't know. I don't know how I would react. I'd do something. I don't know how it would react if you just took your dick out. If you here's the thing, if and I, I've been around guys who've taken their dick out and I've laughed. I'm yeah. not talking about that. I'm talking about me going into a bathroom, me coming back out, and we're, and you're naked on the couch and you sit next to me and touch my dick or something. I'm like not that. doing that shit. I don't know. I wouldn't do it. I don't know. I don't know. I say don't do it. And I've been in cokey situations where I could see it coming on. And, I left, and yeah. I left before it even happened. Oh, dude, some guy in New Orleans one time had indoor, had fucking pat, uh, locks on his bathroom. This guy gets me into the bathroom. We're doing some cocaine after the Super Bowl or something. And next thing I know, they have two doors in the bathroom, you know? And he have, puts a fucking bolt on one of them. And I'm like, Jesus, dude. And then I look over at the other one, and it has a bolt on it. I'm like, I'm out of here, Jack. You know, and I thought about trying to do a little more cocaine and then just keeping my foot in the door wedge while I did it. But I was like, fuck, no, that. no, 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 I'm just no, out of no, here no, no, no. because you don't know what that guy. Had. I mean, you just I don't know. I but you know what the place where that happens the most, bro, and you can hear it happening in the distance is Los Angeles. Bro. Yes. Yes. This no. is the kind of place like, you know, for as much as this as Los Angeles and the people out here call out like the rest of America for having shitty values and this and that. This place is fucked up, Jack. This place is the dark arts, bro. This is, people have no idea. <clears throat> you know, if you really think about it, and I'm not uh, being a funny guy here or whatever, the Me Too movement has slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Thank God it lost momentum. Yeah. It was getting too out of control. I have a daughter. I was raised by a single mom. I have a wife. A ton of my friends are females. Yeah. And I feel for you. But it was getting, I think when Argento got busted for fucking the underage kid. Yeah. And then these women came out against Kavanaugh and that, you know, 36 years is a long time. I changed a lot. Oh, yeah. 36 years. Since 1982, I think of the person I am and I've changed four times. Yeah, agreed. You know, that's number one. You can't take that away from a man and a woman. And number two, I think that, you know, you have your fucking Cosby's. You have your Harvey Weinstein. So Harvey yeah. Weinstein was ten times worse than what we know. Right. And but the, follow, right. And we the people that about have... it last night or two nights ago with <clears> Felicia. <throat> and there's twenty more Harvey Weinsteins. A hundred percent. And there's a lot of actresses hiding those men still. And they knew about him. It's only whenever the you know the thing the gavel starts to fall and it affects people's pocketbooks and shit that they or they realize their money's safe, then they'll chime up. Well, I love NBC. They gave me Sampling the Sun. They gave me Chico and the Man. They gave me News Radio. They've given me a lot of shows I've liked. Yeah. But think about that. I want you two guys and the people listening at home to think about that. Mm -hmm. NBC knew about Bill Cosby. Again, NBC knew about Bill Cosby. Right. But they didn't give a fuck because of the money he was generating. Yeah. Okay. That goes with any sport. Conor McGregor could do whatever the fuck he wants. Oh, yeah. When you generate that type of money, you want to come out at the weigh-in with a bottle of whiskey and a fucking and give it to the president of the fucking league or the whatever he calls himself, 
you know, when you're that type of person. Daniel White. You could do whatever the fuck you want, yeah. you know? So yeah. there's 20 Harvey Weinsteins yeah. that, that, that we have fucking, not yeah. been exposed yet. Or nobody really. Sean you know, Weinstein, Dixon Weinstein. Yeah, fucking. there's there's a bunch of Weinstein's that have not been exposed that are yeah. hiding now. Yeah, went away quietly into the night that yeah. said, you know what, we got away with this for a long time. We didn't, nobody came out. Yeah, I, and here's one. You know, one thing that I started to notice when it was, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of comedians out there that start to use it as a, and not even comedians. I mean, I guess there's just. It's uncomfortable when you start to feel like, and I just try to trust my instincts. I know a lot of women are, you know, taken advantage of. I know, dude, a lot of men get objectified by women as well these days, and people don't want to talk about that, you know? And I know that sounds like kind of a bitch thing to say, but, you know, there's a lot of women out there using men as they see fit as well, you know, for different things. And, you Here's know, the place. Yeah, here in Here's LA. Here's the place. Yeah. In L.A., Here's this business. Place. And so I don't like it when you get a lot of these, you know, fancy ladies saying, oh, feminism, this and feminism, that. But they're just selling books and bullshit to you. You know what I'm saying? They're just peddlers. They don't give a real fuck about anybody but themselves. And, I, you know, that's one thing I hope technology at one point can, like, tell people's hearts, you know? Like, I hope at one point, like, a Fitbit, you could wear a Fitbit that tells you, like, if that person actually has any genuine care in themselves for you. You know? And I think that that's when technology is really going to help us because right now we're out here fucking around you know people jerking off guys addicted to their own you know semen and everything all of this shit on the internet and it's just you know we're in the rot gut stages of technology right now we're still learning about this shit we're in a place bro <clears throat> but yeah the me too thing was too stuff too it was too well here's i just wanted to get this point out sorry to interrupt you joey no no, 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 no. um girls started asking me can i come on the road with you to open for you right and I was afraid to ha let them come with me because I don't trust, like, that's what that movement kind of did to me. Because I've always tried to value women. Yes, like, have I, uh, I'm sure I've objectified women before sexually, you know, and wanted, you know, to be with a woman just for sex or had sexual interests, you, you know, like, lead some of my thoughts. I think some of that's limbic in a man. You're going to, you know, if I see a woman, I don't, you know, my first thought isn't like, I want to you know, buy her a house and just think about her always. I, my, some of my thought is in my dick, you know, and that's nature. And that's mother nature puts some of your brain in, in the end of your dick. And the thing that gets me is like now it's like women will ask me, well, hey, can, could I come and feature for you? And it's like, I don't know. Like, that's very scary. Like I've loved, uh, two years ago, I'd have been like, yeah, I'll give any woman, like I don't have any issue with it, right? I'm not going to try to fuck this girl. You know, I respect her as an artist. But now I'm like, what if this girl has some crazy intention? Well, no. <clears throat> you know who you're taking on the road. I think right, but it makes me second I guess I think Kate Quigley and Felicia Michaels. I've known them both for years. Yeah, yeah. Kate, I, I have no have issue. No, I have no... It would not uh, turn me on to fuck Kate. I love her to death and she's beautiful. She's right. like a little sister. Yeah. You know, Felicia's like a sister to me. Yeah. So if I went on the road with a woman that came up to me, like I've had women ask me, and they not they don't stay at the hotel. They stay at their own home. They live in Austin, or right. something like that. I have no problem, bro. I don't play that shit at all. I know what it's like to be a young girl. I have a daughter, and I remember what it was like twenty years ago. I'm gonna tell you who can't stand me. Right. Well, I'll do thinking, that. I was thinking about this the other day. You know who cannot stand me? No. You know who you can't mention my name around? Chelsea Handler. Oh, she's the worst. The first time I met Chelsea Handler, I went off on her. In a sexual way. You tried to fuck her? She was fucking gorgeous. Yeah. She was gorgeous. I knew that at that time she was doing drugs. Yeah. She was opening up for Dave Vitell. I was fucked up on drugs. Did y'all ever fuck? No. What, are you fucking retarded? Are no. you fucking crazy? No. I think it's crazy with fuck I just someone. I think people fucking, fuck each other. I think, I, I, she, I'm telling you, you can't mention my name around her. I went to that black club. She um, still wants to fuck you? No, bro. Stop trying to be funny. There I'm not no trying to be funny. There was no fucking involved. I was a fucking asshole to her. We were doing that dumb black club on fucking... J-Spot. No. The other one. On Union Station. Beverly, Beverly Boulevard. Up down the block from the chicken place. There used to be a club there one night. and there was Comedy still, Union. Comedy Union. This had to be 1998, bro. And I was out there every night with a package... 
You know, and I'm at the oh, store. Oh, you were geeked up. And I'm geeked up, luring bitches with coke and shit. Yeah. And I go to and the she's comedy, there. And I go to the comedy union to do a spot, and I see Chelsea Handler looking finer than a motherfucker. Did she have big breasts then or oh, what? Oh, in 1998, Chelsea yeah. Handler was fucking banging. So we start talking. She tells me what her could She's very sweet to me. Yeah. She tells me what her credentials were, and not... Six minutes into the conversation, I'm like, let's get a rock of coke and let me eat your pussy and shit. And her face turned pale. Really? And she's crazy as it is, but I knew that I had done something wrong. Like mm. I had, and then three months later, she was dating a friend of mine. And I went to a, a black party. guy? No, a white guy. And I went to a party and saw her. And the look she gave me was just mm. horrid. And after that, Somebody came up to me one day and they go, why does she hate you so much? And I yeah. go, because one night she caught me, you know, like just sometimes Squirling. women throw throw you mm -hmm. off. You know what I'm saying? Like oh, she yeah. would, You have no idea how good she looked that night. Yeah. Like this is when Chelsea had the Volvo. That's how, that's when she had the Volvo. Wow. She was banging. She would go up to the store and do the 915 spot every night. Fucking banging. But I had never met her before. Yeah. I had never met her before. I saw her and we started talking. And the next minute we were talking about cocaine and shit. And next thing you know, I'm like, Chelsea, I got to tell you something. You look fine in a mother. Wow. Yeah. Let's go somewhere and do some blow. And she was like, what the fuck are you talking you some about? Get the fuck out of you, disgusting, fat and slob. Really? Were Gross. you fatter? No, I just, just I was just you know, a gross person, man. man. I didn't know I was doing coke. And, yeah. Until this day, you can't mention my name. Or it's fucking hysterical. But at least I'm honest about it. Yeah. I, I didn't grope her or Harvey. Her. I just asked for the truth. I'm gonna suck you. You know, I was. And, 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 oh the, yeah. When and, you're and, on and cocaine, not, man. And from '98 to 2000 till I met Terry '97, '96, that was all I had. I wasn't a handsome guy. Yeah. So I would just tell you, I got an eight ball of coke and you got a pussy. What do you want to do? Yeah. You want to sit here and talk to Lee all night about fucking computers and podcasts? <laughs> yeah, I know. Or you want to come up to the room and get your little monkey eating with a coke? Yeah. Uh -huh. on it? If you say that to 10 women, two of them are going to go home with oh, you. Oh, dude, I'm about to go home with you, bro. If you say it 10 times. Right now. If you go up to 10 women and say that, one of you is going to take you up on your fucking arm. Yeah. You want me to so fucking it was crazy. hunt that fox with this with yeah, these rocks, baby? Yeah, it was, it was baby. fucking crazy. Oh, dude, that was craziest. I remember, yeah, man. And she, yeah, I, I remember she came into the, I was working at some club over there. They used to have that. When I moved to town, man, I really started doing comedy in Los Angeles. You know, when I really think about it, like, I think the first time I ever went up on stage was in New Orleans. But after that... I just happened to be out here. I came out here to visit a buddy, and then next thing you know, they had comedy. I ended up living with my friend, and they had comedy down the street from us over on San Vicente, over in Brentwood. And so they had a place over there. That guy with the wooden leg used to run it. TJ, um, White Boys of Comedy, Mark Franco, and TJ Mark, somebody. Not TJ Mark Walters, different TJs. But uh, they it was two blocks away, so I walked down there on Wednesday night. And they started letting me get up. But uh, anyway, Bruco had a room over there in Westwood. And Chelsea Handler would come in. Jim Norton would come in and stuff. And this was, Chelsea wasn't like famous or anything then. But she was kind of popular, you know. She was a comedian. It was, it was like real amateurs over there. And uh, and yeah, I just didn't like her. I went and did her show one time. And she wouldn't even look at me. And she just treated me. And then on social media and stuff, it, like, and social media is not a good way to judge somebody, but, you know, sometimes we do. And she just doesn't seem to have any empathy for people. There's something about her that makes me seem like she's just disconnected. When you, did, you did the TV show for her. Yeah. How many times did you do it? Just one time. And what was her behavior towards you? She wouldn't look at me, you know. She would talk to me, but wouldn't look at me. And she just made me feel... I don't know. She didn't make me feel like welcome, you know? And when you're young and you're nervous, and I already got nervous, and I already, you know, the industry had like, you know, it's never really given me much. You know, this industry's never given me much. You know, it's crazy to me. You're just getting a show over there at Fox, you know? Or I don't know if we can talk about that or whatever, but, you know, or an opportunity for that, you know? It's like, it's crazy. To, it's like, it just, but anyway, I've always had that little bit of chip on my shoulder maybe, but yeah, she just made me feel like, I don't know, like I wasn't, 
funny or I wasn't good enough or just stuff like that, you know? There's nothing worse than going on something and somebody shuns you and ex you expect it. Yeah, because I had expectations. I had expect at least there'd be some niceness, you know, like there's some excitement. Instead, it was like she's just kind of like this, this star, this thing. But now to me, she, she, I have this vision of her and this could be wrong of like a lonely, you know, older woman in like a castle with all this money. And she's just lonely. And I don't want anybody to end up that way. And that could just be me thinking that way to make myself feel better, you know, that she, that I felt like she was mean to me. But I, you know, I, she seems like a real cunt to me. So whatever. You, you know, know, you got to give something up for something, you know. And with fame comes, you know, like I remember watching some program and Jennifer Aniston said when they shot the pilot for Friends that, to celebrate, the guy took her to Vegas. The executive producer took everybody to Vegas. Wow. And then gave them each $500 and said, walk to the casino and gamble this because that's the last time you're, able to, you're ever going to be able to walk to a casino again. Wow. That's how big you guys are going to be, you know. They knew it out of the gate, huh? They knew it out of the gate, you know. And it's so weird how you... That's amazing. Listen, man. I was in this for so long, and I struggled for so long as a human being, mm -hmm. that no matter what you throw at me now, it wouldn't change. Yeah. Like, I'm done. Like Yeah, you already you, baked. You only had me to go crazy when I was maybe up to 32. Yeah. 33, 34. Yeah, I would have gone a different crazy. I would have gone drug crazy at that age. But I always knew what I was. What makes people crazy in this town is not knowing what they are. Mm. Either they, they're too much mm -hmm. or too little. It's like being somewhere where you don't belong. I always stress that because one day you're going to do that and you're going to see how bad you feel. And you're going to think of me as a comedian or an actor. You know, when you when you shoot a show. Mm -hmm. You ever shoot a show for somebody? Yeah, mm -hmm. you shoot and you go to these shows and you see the same fucking comics. Mm -hmm. They're always coming by to say hello. Yeah. Yeah, I got invited to this, so I came. And you look at them and you go, have you shot this show? And they go, no. And you feel bad for them. You go, then why the fuck are you here? Because I shot this show, one episode, and I feel, being, I feel bad being here. Like, I shot one scene on one show and I feel like a fucking asshole. So you didn't even shoot the show, but you're down here doing what? What is your purpose? Yeah. What is your fucking purpose? You look like a fucking idiot. Yeah. You're eating free food, whatever. If you don't belong somewhere, do not be at that fucking place. Yeah. Do not be at that place. You asked me a question before. You go to, you take Lee on the road. Lee's been doing comedy less than a year. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I would I didn't not that. do him any favors. Yeah. It would not do him any favors. It would ruin him. Yeah. It would ruin him. I know that. Yeah. He's not ready by no means. He's, yeah. he's two years away or I'd ruin him. His whole perception of stand-up would be ruined. That's a good point. That's, that's very true. His whole perception. I took him to the Wilbur Theater. He saw what it's like. Now the rest is up to him. Yeah. He's two years away from even stepping on the stage with me on, on a plane. Yeah. Because I know what it would do to him. Yeah. He needs to go on his own now and go to Lexington, Kentucky and go to all the places where they've never seen a Jew. Yeah. And do that. And Jay get back down, to me brother. in two or three years. And you can we'll do blackface, too, if you're Jewish, I think. Don't you guys get no, that? No, no, I think I'll never, I think hold off on I that. They just fucking fired Kellen Megan. Now you got to bring up blackface. You like the kiss of death tonight. What the fuck is wrong with you? I don't want to hear blackface. I don't want to talk about blackface. They just fired Megan Kelly, and you want to bring up blackface. You got great things happening in your fucking life. Leave blackface alone, all right? I just didn't know if Lee could do it. No, no, I'm, I'm going to hold off on that one. No, it's the truth. Yeah. I would not be doing him any favors. Oh, you wouldn't be doing him any favors the at all. The first guy that took me out, I was doing comedy four years. Yeah. First time I got taken out, and I wasn't ready. But it was fraternities. Really? I, yeah, it was. Who was it? His name was Todd Jordan, and he took me on like two or three or four weeks of fraternities every night. It was rush season, mm -hmm. whatever that is, and he would have a different frat every night. Two night, two frats, three frats. And I'd been doing comedy four years, and I was just bomb. I was like an Arab. 
Oh, yeah. I was just going into places to bomb. Yeah. I would call a bomb alert. <laughs> you guys are prepared. You're going to get a bomb. I wasn't ready. Yeah. And, I, and at that time, that's all I wanted. And I would say to myself, whew, I'm happy I didn't get this call two years ago. I still remember going, like doing comedy a couple months and going to an NBC. No. Johnny Walker. The liquor? In the 80s and 90s, if you wanted to be anybody, you had to win the Johnny Walker Red Competition in San Francisco. Wow. That's what elevated you. Every year, Johnny Walker did a national comedy competition, and it would end up on Channel 13 or something, but you still got national exposure. Yeah. And now you went into clubs. That was one of the credits. It was either that, The Tonight Show, or HBO. Oh, yeah. So that was the exposure. What were we talking about? The uh, first time Todd Jordan Todd, taking you on the road. Todd, so Todd Jordan. Like, I took you on. You were ready, he said. I was almost ready. You were bombing. So are you, already, yeah, I was you were bombing. Already, not saying he, that. He took yeah. me on a three-week camp. Wow. What that is, it's three weeks of doing comedy every night for, for three weeks, for <sighs> five nights a week. And you get to adjust. And that really helped me right away. That was a big push. When I finished those three weeks... I was a better comic. And wow. then I was doing triple. Then I started doing triple runs. Yeah. And I did triple runs for four years. Wow. And that's a complete different adjustment. That's every night. You got to adjust, plus drive eight hours, plus fucking do radio. But, oh, yeah, that's, that's fucking navigational comedy. You know, sometimes you finish the gig and drive that night because you got an eight-hour <sighs> drive. I might as well get to the hotel and sleep yeah. all day. You know, it teaches you how to deal with this. Yeah, with that's what I struggle with later. now. Yes, a Is lot the, of people. Not taking care of myself and not timing things well. A lot of people <clears> don't <throat> know. You know, there's, there was a comic. His name was Doug Williams, a great guy. Great guy. He created a show. He got uh, Martin to sign off on it. Wow. And it was one of the first comedy shows to go to Stars. Stars was a black network at the time, and they had a comedy series. Mm -hmm. And it did like three years. That guy today, a friend of mine called me and said he went on a cruise ship, and he saw Doug Williams on a cruise ship. Wow. What happened was Doug Williams got, he, he went to a roast. Oh, yeah, and Jamie Foxx made Jamie fun Fox of him. Jamie Foxx tore, tore him up. He that was kind of mean of Jamie Foxx. Did you think that? It was very mean of Jamie Foxx, but the problem was he didn't belong there. He did not belong there. Who Doug Williams didn't? No. He was nobody to belong there. He was too young to be up there. Not too young. He just didn't belong there. Just did not belong in that room. He knew it, but he was a gavon. His eyes were bigger than his stomach. Yeah. And he went there anyway. They got burnt. Yeah. And that ended everything. You cannot go somewhere where you do not belong in comedy or in life. Right. If you don't belong there, don't go down there because you're gonna get in trouble. Yeah, that's a great man. That's a really a really. With great stand lesson. up, I hate that shit. When people say I'm out there, what do they call it? I'm uh, running the light. No. What do they call when it? When they go out and mingle, there's a name for that. Networking. Networking. Oh you're yeah. Networking Fuck that. Rub my balls on your network. I've never been a networker. You like network that. on stage. Yeah. You network on stage. Every I've always been nervous to, to talk to people. Yeah. I used to be nervous when I would come in here. I used to be nervous when I, like, there's some comedians that still make me kind of nervous sometimes when I see them, you know, to be around. It's just because you don't know them well or you always look up to them, you know, and then you see them and it makes you nervous. You well, the know? worst thing about a comic that you look up to is when you go to the store and you meet them. And, and this happens to comics or me probably. You don't get the reception that you're looking for. Yeah, that's what I worry about. Some sometimes. of my idols, I didn't get the reception I was looking for, so I didn't talk to them. I didn't talk to Andrew Dice Clay for the first year I was at the store, yeah. and I'd see him up there five nights a week. Why? Because you weren't. It wasn't your place. No. Yeah, he had nothing to say to him. No. He had no circles that was no. same. Yeah. No. 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 And no. You know, and then you get emails from people. Well, it's terrible to meet your your heroes because you approached me the wrong way. Yeah. And at the wrong time, yeah, there's a dude that comes up to me a lot. He's always kind of coked up, I can tell, at the comedy store. And now I hate that guy coming around. We have no, he knows it's uncomfortable too. I'm like, why does he keep doing this, you know? Um, I don't judge people on the drug aspect. I don't care if somebody does drugs. But he's always trying to get around. me in Ponzi schemes and shit. Yeah, no, those people I just leave. I tell them to get the fuck out of my face. Yeah. I don't want to hear about it. When I'm doing comedy, I'm doing comedy, bro. Yeah. 
And like this week, I have a rough week. Like t t t tonight, I'll be in New York, you know? And that's my roughest week because I have to deal with family. Yeah. I have to talk to people. You know, I got a two long, 200 people waiting to take a picture. Yeah. And you paid $20 and now I got to talk to you for a half hour. I got to find the way to say, listen, bro, can you step aside and let these, but wait, wait, wait. Remember the time we went? No. Let these people take the pictures and then you can talk to me all you want. It's right. very tough for people to understand that. Yeah. It's yeah, it's weird. Tough. That's where I'm getting, like, it's getting, like. You know, I've been struggling a lot with this because it's like, you know, I love, you know, it's like you work so hard to get people to come out and then people start coming out. And, you know, it's a lot of like my audience is dudes like me, you know, that, have, that struggle with stuff or just regular people, you know, good people. You know, I feel like a lot of our audiences are probably similar, like good people that come out to enjoy themselves, you know. And I want to be able to spend time with each one of them afterwards. Like you as, sell t-shirts afterwards? As a regular person, yeah. See, I don't. Right. Because I want them to be able to come to me and talk to me. And not have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw it. You want a t-shirt? Go online. Yeah. I'm not carrying t-shirts across the country. I'm not. If I want to I don't carry all this shit. I mail it there and sell it. Still the same fucking point. Yeah. Uh, because then again, you have a, a different complication. Now. You have people that feel. Now I bought a t-shirt. So now I'm going to give you a fucking ear Oh, beating. I see what you're saying. I don't have time for any of beating in between shows. Yeah. I, I need to focus in between. You want a good show from me? Yeah. Or you want a fucking t-shirt? Right. You want a good show? Let's forget about the fucking t-shirt. Yeah, I'll tell people, do not, you don't, don't feel obligated to buy a shirt to come and say hey or to anything But yeah, like just that. think about it. Would you go say hey and not buy a shirt for somebody? That's no. Point. I'd rather you not sell the fucking shirt and let them come over and shake their hand. Yeah. You know, it's like when people pay for VIP packages. I feel bad for you. Yeah. I feel bad for you. For two reasons. I would never charge to do a VIP package. Because now I'm forced to talk to you and you're forced to talk to me. Mm. That's not a relationship. Right. That's bullshit. I, don't, I would never sell a VIP package. I want you to come up to me after the show, take a picture, tell me what you got to tell me and get the fuck out of here. Yeah. If you pay me the 85 bucks for a VIP, that means I got to hear your fucking ear beating for two hours. Yeah. We don't have two hours. Right. You know, I want you to come to the shows. I want you to enjoy yourself. I want you to take a picture. We're going to communicate while we're taking a picture, and then you got to go. There's 200 people behind you. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to, I don't ever want to take money from somebody to feel that I have to talk to them after a show. Yeah. So they can come to a certain gated area. I think that is the most grossest. Is that how they thing. do that? Yeah. Like you can sell VIP package, and 20 people come in the back afterward and talk to you, and you take a picture with them. Listen, how about we do this? How about I don't sell you dick? You shake my hand, we take a picture, you go your way, I go my way. Yeah. We talk for two minutes. You know, you got to be considerate of other people. Right. And that's well, it. And most people are, but here's so here's the thing that I'm running into, right? And so this is a good thing that I can ask you, actually, because you have experience, is I'm noticing, like, so I'll go out after the first show, right? And there's a line, like you say, you know, there's 100, 150 people want to say, hey, want to meet me, and I want to meet them. But then by the end of that, I am so like just exhausted emotionally, bro, that then it's like the second show, I find myself being more temperamental because like all of like your kindness and your just your it's it you just feel a little empty, you know, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like I don't care about those people. Or I don't it just gets hard. You know what I'm saying, though? <clears throat> and am I complaining? Is that like just like a no, you're not complaining. But people who are listening to this have to decide what they want. I have to decide what do I want. Yeah. Me, I want to see a fucking great show. Yeah. When I go anywhere to a concert, anything, I want to see a great fucking show, man. That's it. Yeah. I want to leave that going, you know what? My $26 was worth it. My twenty seven fifty was worth it. So for me to do that, guess what? Sometimes. Mm. Number one, the shows are sold out. Yeah. The staff, as soon as I get there Thursday, they say to me, listen, you sold out Friday and Saturday. We only have one exit. Is there any way you can't come out in between shows? Now, you know anything about me, that breaks my heart. Right. Yeah, that's I, how I feel. I know you got a babysitter. I know you drove. You paid to park. I'm aware of all these things. Yeah. But guess what? I got to do best. what's best for the club. And for the people for the second show. Yeah. 
somebody talked my wife into me selling t-shirts. And I noticed that that emotional hour in between Mm -hmm. was by the time I got on stage to the second show, there was nothing left. Yeah, that's what I'm starting to notice a little bit. People, there's nothing left. There's nothing left. The hugs, the kisses, the pictures. You go back in, it's showtime. Now you're running late because your people didn't get in. Yeah. Now that show starts 25 minutes late. That means there's 20. Every time a minute ticks past showtime is one more minute they'll be drunk. Right. Right, yeah, and then they're drunk. Now this confusion. Now the babysitter's later. There is nothing mm. that pisses me off more than a club that starts a show late. Yeah, me either. You want to not make me come back to your club? Yeah. Start a show late. 7 o'clock is 7.05. I understand people are driving. Right. And 9.30 is 9.35. Yeah. I don't want to be on stage at 11, 12.30 at night for a 9 o'clock show. Yeah, fuck that. That's so why what do you do then? What do I, I do? do? You know, man, if the first show is sold out, I cannot go out. If the first show is sold out, the club does not want you to go out. And your fans are okay with that? They have to be. Yeah. They have to be. We're not in the picture business. We're in the comedy business. I'm in the business of giving you the best show that I can give you. Yeah. So for me able to for me to be able to do that, A, I can't be out there in between shows slinging shirts with glasses on, taking pictures. You're absolutely right. It draws your energy. Yeah. You know, this is the week that everybody wants to take me out to dinner at 5 o'clock. Lee Sayat, you know me a long time. You don't see me after 4. Yeah. You do not see me after 4. I will, when I go out in the morning, I will buy a protein bar. Yeah. So I do not have to leave my room before after 4 o'clock. Yeah, you take a rest. Those three hours before the show, those are my time. Right. I put my feet up. I watch an episode of Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. I hit the vapor pen, and my notebook is wide open, and there's a pen close by. And I also got another notebook open somewhere else. For what is that? Whatever comes to my mind. Comedy over here and a story over here. Sons of Anarchy over here, a glass, two things of water, a pack of nicotine gum, yeah. and a vapor pen. And that's what I do from 4 to 7. That's okay. cool, huh? Show starts at 7.30. By 6.15, I start stretching. I throw some punches. I turn the shower on. I let the shower get nice and hot. I start stretching a little bit just to get my body oh, yeah, more man. just to work. Yeah. That's what you do. No, I'm feeling you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? I got, you know, my agents, they're great. You sit here all week. Yeah. Then on Friday at 6.30, I want to they call want you. They want to call offer. you. Listen, call your mother on a Friday at 6.30. I'm only concerned with the two shows. Yeah. That's all I'm concerned about. And this is what work, works best for you. This is what works best for me. Yeah. A great headliner once told me, mm-hmm. great headliner once told me that if you headline, rest is the most important thing. For me to give the audience the show I want, yeah. there's no dinners at four. I'm not meeting you to smoke out. I'm not meeting nobody. Yeah. I'm not meeting nobody. Man, it's so when crazy. That 20, this, I need a lot. Of, I need pay, to talk about this. When you pay twenty-five to twenty-eight dollars to see me, yeah, you don't see me out of the hotel room. There's no this Thursday. I go to do a pot, two podcasts in New York. You see the show. And Friday, and I'm back in my room by one. Yeah. And Friday, I go to the cemetery and bring flowers for my mother. Yeah. Beside that, nobody sees me. The reason why I stay where I stay is because it's two of my favorite places and they did a little bit. Yeah. And this hotel has breakfast for free. Yeah, I like that. And even though it's a half a Hindu hotel, yeah, the eggs are good, it's white bread, and they got oatmeal that's fucking out of this world. Hmm. So I'm at least held over to one of my friends could pick me up at 10 or I take the fucking bus into the, the city or whatever. Huh. Every city I go to is planned out. Yeah. But I never take away from my show. Mm. That means there's no T-shirt. Uh, yeah. There's no contact in between shows. In between shows, I sit, I reflect on the last show, and I reflect how the next show is going to be better. Interesting. That's it. I don't care if my mother's there. I don't care if your grandfather's coming. I don't really want to do much. Yeah. I don't really want to do much. Wow, wow. Wow, wow. Game day is game day for us. People work hard for their doubt, and I have to give them their value for that dollar. And for me to give them the value for that dollar, mm-hmm. I got to take care of myself. 
Yeah, that's what I'm struggling with right now. I got to take care of myself. I'm feeling exhausted So a lot. Friday night, you stay up. Like, Friday night's my pill night. If somebody gives me a pill at the show, I take it. I bring back a protein bar, maybe a fucking... Banana? Uh, a banana. Yeah. Maybe I have an apple from the lounge. I go upstairs and I drink soda, and I watch two or three episodes or something. I have no curfew on Friday night. Yeah. That means Saturday morning I wake up nice and early. I eat breakfast, a nice breakfast. I smoke a joint. I go for a nice walk at 8, 8.30. I go for a half a mile walk mm -hmm. just to let my body know I'm alive. I go back to the room. I watch a little Netflix. I pass out for another three hours. Now I get up, take a shower, and I go for a nice lunch, a nice cut of salmon, yeah, a nice salad, water. You take good care of yourself. Yeah. And you go back to your hotel room and you write for an hour. Yeah. And while that hour, you're writing, you're digesting your meal. Uh-huh. So now at 4.30, you go down to the hotel gym. Yeah. And you stretch out. You do 25 minutes on the elliptical, 10 minutes on the bicycle, and you draw some weights around for 45 minutes. You get that funk out of your system. Now that energy's... Up. Because now you're, you're, you're building your own energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're working on your own cheat. Yeah, now. you're not letting the world just give you no, a jump. No, no. I don't yeah. want to hear your stupid stories, Jack. I ain't got time for that. I'd rather not have physical contact all day. And Lee knows. Anybody who goes down the road with me, they know. They see me for breakfast, lunch, and I don't see you till post time. I yeah. I'll read it that. I don't want to see nobody. Yeah, man, that's, that's and interesting. that's the best show I could give you as Joey Diaz. If I deter from that plan, we don't have a good show. So after the second show, you'll do the pictures and stuff? Yes. After the second show, I'll do the pictures. Maybe I need to start trying that. Because I've just been, honestly, man. I know a thousand people don't do dick. There's a thousand people out there who don't do dick. I will take pictures with you. Before shows, I have a superstition not. Because one time in Columbus, a hippie hugged me and he had armpit of debt. Oh, yeah. And it got on my shirt while I was on oh, stage. Oh, they got grilling cheeses I in could there. smell fucking onions for two shows. Now, when I took pictures of people, people were looking at me like I smelled. Yeah. You know, you. it takes a long time to come to terms with comedy. By the way, I always wanted to thank you for supporting me on the Netflix special. You yeah. showed up. Lee showed up. You showed up on your own dime. You saw... The, the response has been good, huh? The response has been great. But... uh it's really weird. I mean, even for that, I had too many distractions. Yeah. Like, I don't wait there. Yeah, in hindsight, even thinking about that, it's in like... In hindsight, you see that... It's like, man, that's like a lot of distraction. I don't want this. Uh, I don't like that. I stick to my own thing. Yeah, in the future, stick have, to what we I do. I have a way for me to give you a good show. I have to do things. Mm -hmm. Please, I know. I know your mother cooks the best chicken. I know you do that. That's all great. Yeah. I really don't give a fuck. I really don't give a fuck. When I get off a plane, that's why when people contact me on the road to do a podcast, I'm not in your town to do a podcast. That's yeah. never going to happen. Yeah, some guy, I, some group yeah. offered me money to do it last week. I did my two podcasts yeah. for the week. That's it. When I go on the road, I don't want to do nothing. All I think about is stand-up comedy and how I can make it better. Before before I go to a town, I Wikipedia, I, I Yahoo. Yeah kickboxing schools if you got a good muay thai school you might pop in there on saturday them. why not yeah. and meet some people have some a little contact in the daytime with some new people yeah and you blow their mind they blow your mind and you're still back in your hotel room by two o'clock yeah that's take beautiful a shower you write you eat you gotta take good care of yourself when you're a feature it's a different story when you're an MC, it's a different story the world don't fall on your shoulders yeah you could go to watch the baltimore ravens and go to a game. The world don't fall on your shoulders. You're just doing 10 minutes. When you're a feature actor, you think I gave a fuck? When I was a feature actor, I went out to dinner. Yeah. Oh, feature actor, I don't give, yeah. Yeah, I don't give a You fuck. give a shit, dude. You could fucking. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. But when you pay, and I got a fucking, you got a babysitter, and you pay to park, yeah. and all those variables, I got to be at the top of my game. There you go. That's the ghost telling you, I che. Time you to gotta shut be it. on your fucking Ooh, it's game. it's late. It's getting late. Theo Vaughn, I love you. Any dates you want to promote, my brother? Um, any dates that I want to promote? Yeah, I'm gonna be in um Lexington. Great club. Yeah, I love and those on Broadway. People. Great club. Yeah, 
great food and the great hotel yeah great city great city in december that's when i'm going to be on there so i'm excited that i'm going there in uh in december where else uh january don't worry about january yeah. just give them one day yeah, why confuse them <laughs> okay. you gotta assume they can't remember their fucking phone number. uh and then saying? yeah what else oh i got uriah faber was on i was on my pod i was on this past weekend so you can check that out as well and um i just want to say thanks so much joey you're always such a you know uh you know you're just a nice man and you always make me feel welcome and you know you call me a lot and i and i just i know that you care and and, and i really feel that and i just i want no, to thank you so I much i care about my blood i care about my yeah. blood this but is... i feel i can feel it though but it some people say that kind of shit and you no. whatever but no, i'm just telling you say i appreciate it man no i know you do thank that's you why I and i love you lee and i'm sorry that i if i made funny when i got no, in here i love you buddy hey, bro Leave him alone. Don't worry about him. Yeah. He's as tough as nail. Oh, he yeah. The dude fuck took him. fucking nine farts, bro. It's fucking, jeez, like Iwo Jim over here on his neck. No, that's a dead sentence. Like the judge will tell you either four farts or 90 days. <laughs> yeah. And most people take them 90 days. Yeah. This poor, this poor Jewish tank sat there and took five of the worst oh, farts oh, you've ever smelt in your fucking life. Even I yeah. was sitting here going, Jesus Christ, my intestines about <laughs> to pop out of my ass. Like, anyway, I love you guys with all my fucking heart, man. Amen. Uh, I want to thank Theo Vaughn. I want to thank my main man, the Christ Killer, who I love with all my heart. I hope I didn't offend you with the comedy line tonight. I just wouldn't be doing you any favors. I would take you somewhere, and then you'd still have to go back and do the work, and then you'd be more mad at me. So you always got to understand I got your back in more ways than one. Thank you very much for always being a great fucking sidekick and a friend and a dear supporter of what we do, and I'm very proud of you. For doing comedy and when the time comes you're gonna be right there with me so good luck to you and your venture you know i love you to death and i support you i break your balls but i break your balls out of love oh no that, i i understood a but lot I'm of people not... don't break your balls they break your balls to be evil i you know i love you with all my heart but anyway forget that love i got for this fucking jew i love him with all my heart that's my problem i got a soft spot for jews i don't know why jews and black people i'll do anything for you but listen this podcast is brought to you by Ridge. Like I said in the beginning, Ridge is a minimalized front pocket wallet that helps you reevaluate your everyday carry, launched by a father son team and funded by Kickstarter in 2013. The Ridge now resides in the pockets of over a quarter of a million men and women. Listen, my old wallet was stacked with shit, the kind of bullshit where you're carrying around for months and years. Say whatever you want to hear, you got to get rid of that shit. Talk about all the pointless stuff that we carry in our wallets. Receipts, hotel room keys, hookers' addresses, spent gift cards. Get rid of all that shit. The leather bindfolds men use resemble suitcases more than wallets. The Ridge helps you carry less, but always what you need, all right? Listen, I love the Ridge personally. When I travel, that's what I got. I got the Ridge, two credit cards, a PBA card, and my ID and I'm ready to go. So do me a favor. Like I said, it's minimal. It's front pocket wallets that designed to help you ditch your bulky wallet. The Ridge wallet is slim, RFID blocking, and it has a lifetime guarantee. And it's going to be the last wallet you'll ever own. So do me a favor. What I'm going to do for the church family today. First off, go to Ridge.com. Check out what I'm talking about. You're going to be blown away. Number two, if you get something, I'm going to get you 10% off with free worldwide shipping by using RidgeWallet.com slash church. Again, that's RidgeWallet.com slash church and use promo code church to link in the description. All right, listen, Ridge Wallet will make a great present. You're going to love it with all your heart, okay? Number three, I love you guys. These guys are tremendous. My wife has been using them to, for years. And again, I got nothing against nobody, but time is time. And if you're saving time, you get postage on demand. All you need is stamps.com. With stamps.com, you got all the services you got at the post office right up from your desk. You can buy and print real U.S. postage for any letter or any package. All available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just click, print, and mail. Ba-boom! You're done. Stamps.com will even send you a digital scale. You can weigh your letters and packages and print the exact amount of postage every time. I love it. My wife uses it to sell out the cups, 
the T-shirts, we've been using them for years. And I'll tell you, I give them 100% recommendation, whether you have a small business or a large business. I'm telling you right now, whatever you're doing and you're mailing out stuff, stamps.com is what you need. So right now, your Uncle Joey is going to give you a special offer. You ready? Grab a pen. I'm going to give you a four-week trial. Includes postage and a digital scale. But don't wait. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else right now. Right now, while we're sitting there, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Joey, J-O-E-Y. Again, that's Joey, J-O-E-Y on the top of the homepage. Again, that's stamps.com. Enter Joey. I want to thank Ridge. I want to thank stamps.com. And I want to thank Quip, okay? Because Quip, again, the best toothbrush I've had in years. Quip was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple and affordable, but most importantly, enjoyable. Like I said, I've used it the last four days. My mouth feels cleaner. My teeth are still chartreuse because God knows what I put in my mouth. But everything feels fresh and clean. My breath smells like dog shit. There's nothing you can do about that as long as your teeth are clean. Why do you use Quip? Since sensitive, sensitive sonic vibration. Gentle enough to use on sensitive gums. People who brush too hard, sometimes electric toothbrushes are too abrasive. It's built with a two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to remind you to switch sides, helping you guide a full and even clean. Why? Because up to 90% of us don't brush for the first, for the full two minutes or don't clean evenly. It's a multi-use cover, mounts to cover your mirror, and then mounts to slide over bristles to go on to brushing. Three out of four of the bristles that are old, worn out, and ineffective. Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes that accepted. It's accepted by the American Dental Association and has thousands of verified five-star reviews. Why I love Quip? Dependable. It's right there, and I can take it on the road. And that's what you're looking for with a toothbrush. So do me a favor. The big favor is this. I love Quip so much, and they're backed by 20,000, 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at 25 gazines, and if you go to Quip.com slash Joy right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. Who's better than you? You're going to have a nice smile at the holidays. You know what I'm saying? You don't got to go to Thanksgiving and cover your mouth because your teeth are green. You're going to get a nice, clean, fresh face, more confidence. So do me a favor. Go to Quip.com slash Joy right now and get your little fucking Quip toothbrush for $25. No, they start at $25. And if you go to Quip right now, you'll get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's how Uncle Joey takes care of you before the holidays. I want to thank Quip. I want to thank Stamps.com. And I thank, want to thank Ridge for sponsoring the podcast. But most importantly, I want to thank you people for two things. For supporting the Degenerates and for supporting our podcast for the last seven years. You know who you are. From Bob Lalingus to Bobby Sharon to, 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 to Goose to fucking my man, the Greek up in Canada. I'm watching you. I know who the fuck you are. My little comedian in Vegas, who I love to death, Freddie Correa. I love all you motherfuckers. So if I forget to say somebody, my man Scott Cunningham, I love you all. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the support on the on the uh, Netflix special. And I'll see you motherfuckers next Tuesday, ready to motherfucking rock a great week of podcast. Lee, kick this fucking mule. Stay black, baby.